Welcome to the very first day of the NanoSafe Digital Congress. We are very happy today to start with an educational program. Um, this is Martin Himley, the chair of the Working Group A on Education, Training and Communication. And this is today the education day of the nano safety cluster. We are very happy to have this uh, event today here. Um, on the very first slide, you see an overview of the program that we are trying to, to offer today. It's a quite dense schedule. I have asked um, experts in the field to give us some educational insight into a couple of very nice and interesting emerging topics of high relevance. So writing really cool papers about these new developments. What is the intention of today? Um, we are trying to offer a kind of working group for so nano safety cluster, working group overarching education session and try to involve you, the audience, the attendees of today's meeting in a very interactive manner to this, um, to this event. A couple of um, housekeeping uh, announcements maybe to the start. You find on the very top a kind of call for action banner. At the moment, we have put there the Nano Safety Cluster Working Group A mailing list. If you're interested in more education, in more training, um, working group overarching, of course, on activities of the Nano Safety Cluster in terms of education training, also communication, um, outreach activities, Join our mailing list. If you follow this link on the, which is the red button on top, um, you get there and you can join the mailing list. You can also join mailing lists of other working groups which you are, which you would like to participate and, and contribute to. We are going to also put on display on this banner later on um, useful links, um, which we need during our uh, educational day today to, for example, surveys that people use to get yourself uh, involved into the discussion of today. Um, you would find the, 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 the links there. Um, you also find other useful information. So for example, to electronic tools that we are going to introduce today in a later session, in session three and four primarily, um, direct links you would be able to find up there. So, um, so much for the for the call for action. Uh, I would also like to encourage all of you to, at any time, whenever you have a question or you want to comment on something or you have a, want to give a perspective or something, your view, use the chat box. We, uh, the hosts of the meeting, this is Simon Clavaguerra, this is myself, Martin Himley, this is Stella Stoikeva, my co-chair of the working group. We're going to raise these questions whenever suitable or at the end of presentations. Anyway, we try to have it as interactively as possible. So we are trying to involve you directly into the discussion whenever something is shown. The intention is education, um, information to understand. For example, if we look at the very first block, um, on intention, I actually did just put the abbreviations there, AOPs, QSARs, IATA, Terms which you may have, re may have read a couple of times, maybe you are involved in these developments, of course, anyway, but maybe you have just read about and you have always wondered, okay, how these are these connect connected somehow? Um, what do they exactly mean? How could they serve risk assessment in nano safety, for example? Uh, in the second block, uh, we are going to uh, look into data, data of important relevance of today. We have uh, gathered much data in nano safety research uh, within the past two decades, I'd say. Um, what's data fairness? How could we get this data accessible to everybody to model us, to build, build on them, to, to develop prediction algorithms for the future? So this is the intention to look into that and what is what are metadata and how complete do metadata have to be that people can really work with this data? Um, after the second block, we are going to have our working lunch of the Nano Safety Cluster. And this is the example everybody may join. The Nano Safety Cluster is assembling. And we are discussing there. And after the working lunch, uh, we are going to have uh, a 
our block three, which is more going into discussion. It's on nano risk governance and uh, also on safe by design for the future. We're going to talk about this concept. We are going to discuss this concept on a couple of uh, applications. So we are introducing case studies and we really want to get you guys involved into discussing it. We want to get ourselves ready for future, ready for the next uh, framework program, Horizon Europe, uh, emerging contaminants, microplastic, nanomedicine, uh, safety assessment of, of novel or innovative or advanced materials or materials for tomorrow, they're called. Um, so what can we take over from all that into the new framework program? This is uh, what we are trying to discuss today. Uh, so please stay in touch with us. Stay tuned to the working group A if you are interested in more information, more education, more training uh, for the future. Um, up there is the call for action. You can press there. You can uh, subscribe to the mailing list and get uh, more information in future and be with us. So with this, I would like to uh, invite the first session chair of the first session, Emerging Approaches in Nano Risk um, Assessment, who is Professor Peter Hoyt from the uh, Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium, um, to introduce uh, yeah, new developments in human hazard assessment, focus on IOPs, QSARS, and IATA. Okay, thank you. Um, so can you please show, yeah, thank you, my slides. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to lead a short session in, in this uh, educational uh, day, uh, the first hour. And the title, what I got here is, is yeah, uh, a bit many abbreviations, why, what and how, and then uh, various emerging approaches, IATA, NAMS, AOPs and QSAR. So, so uh, it's, I think this needs somewhat more explanation. Uh, um, so first maybe the what, uh, so, so what are all these abbreviations? And I tried to yeah, find the short, uh, the short de definitions of, of all these abbreviations. Uh, on European and or uh, AOCD uh, websites. And so IATA is a uh, integrated assessment of uh, testing approaches. So this means that it is a kind of flexible approach in chemical safety assessment, uh, where um, people try to integrate um, and translate uh, data from multiple sources uh, uh, and, and multiple methods. Uh, so it's a broad uh, way of, of assessing the safety. And then um, the second one, the NAMS, is, is relatively similar, uh, but here is clearly indicated that it is a non-animal based approach uh, where, uh, again, broad as possible information in the context of safety uh, chemical safety hazard and safety and, and, and risk assessment is brought together but also techniques are used or introduced like uh, read the cross uh, screening prioritization and so on and then we have two uh, other uh, abbreviations in, in this listing of, of the title, the AOPs, which are the adverse outcome pathways. In this, uh, models are built uh, in which we try to, to find, um, based on the molecular interaction at first step of, of the, uh, the chemical used or the material used. Uh, this is nano safety. So we are talking mainly about uh, nanoparticles in this, this meeting. Uh, and we go from molecular events to cellular events up to uh, full animal uh, events. So, so it's really a pathway eh, of different outcomes. Eh, and at the end, we see an in vivo adverse outcome. And, and so we build a pathway from molecular event to that outcome. 
And then another model, right? it's a more mathematical based model or models, eh, which these are the QSARs or the SARs. Eh? So Q stands for quantitative and then SAR is structure activity relationship. And so here, um, based purely on the chemical structure eh, and certainly with aid of data, which is uh, available already on, on hazard and a risk of a certain compound, uh, models are built, mathematical models are built to predict biological fate of a certain compound. So this is more or less the what, and it also includes already a little bit the how. And so why do we do these uh, different approaches? So um, clearly, uh, I think the first uh, issue the here is we try to get a good view on the hazard of material. Uh, so, so the biological, toxicological effects, uh, it's in fact in all the four uh, approaches. So it is mainly test data driven when we look to IATA and NAMS. Uh, and it's more specific for the AOPs. Uh, it's key events, molecular events. And initially, these models are built for one specific compound with an uncertain adverse outcome. Uh, but we see also see that people try to make it uh, AOPs for more gene generic context. And the same a bit for the Q source or the SARS, uh, which, which is chemical characteristics, where the chemical characteristics are very important of a compound, and then uh, biological effects are looked at and modeled uh, in these mathematical models. Uh. And so, and also here uh, in, in this QSARS, very specific to sometimes, if possible, to a broader context. And uh, another why is that uh, in all the testing uh, strategies, uh, we internationally try to reduce the use of animals. The three R's are important, and this is clearly indicated in, in the NANS. Uh, but in fact, in all the strategies uh, shown here, so more in vitro, in silico, in chemical, but no animal approaches. And then um, clearly also these uh, methods are there to support the risk assessment, the one a bit more than the other, but as Cole, certainly all of them have supporting in, in risk assessment. And they are all have the purpose that we get a better mechanistic understanding of the chemical interaction, particle interaction with tissues, with cells towards an adverse outcome, eh? and that we use less animals and get a better safety, human safety, environmental safety. So that is a bit the why, what, and also how uh, this has been approached. Um, just before I present or, or I invite the first speaker. I also want to point out that um, you can find more on this type of approaches tomorrow in room three. Eh? There are two talks on adverse outcome pathways and in room four, uh, a bit overlapping, I'm afraid. Um, also there, a lot of talks on risk assessment approaches and, and adverse outcome pathways. So, then the how, uh, that's not me that's going to present this, it's going to be presented by uh, three different speakers, um, Dario Greco, uh, Penny Nijmark and uh, Marvin uh, Martens. But I first invite here uh, Dario Greco, who is going to talk about beyond chemical centric models from toxical genomics to integrated approaches for IATA developments. So please, Dario. Okay, hello everybody. I hope you can hear me and uh, by all means probably also see my ugly face. Uh, nice nice to virtually see you all. It's a sad time, but that's what we get nowadays. 
Um, well, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here and thanks, Peter, for the uh, introduction. So, yes, as, as uh, Peter was telling, I will uh, give you a very brief overview on some of the projects we are doing in my lab in, uh, in, in Finland, uh, where we are trying to integrate uh, uh, toxicogenomics approaches uh, to chemocentric models in order to uh, hopefully gain a better insight uh, into the uh, not only the, 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 the safety assessment of nanomaterials, but also uh, eventually uh, in the future, the uh, safe by design driven by this kind of uh, reasoning. Now, it's it's clear that uh, that uh, toxicology is uh, drifting from uh, describing, purely describing um, um, uh, phenotypic events to a more sophisticated description of the mechanisms by which an exposure might uh, eventually interact with the biological system and cause a certain uh, outcome of interest. Now, when we look at this in, in the perspective of um, uh, of uh, um, uh, designing new uh, chemicals, um, it's it's obvious that traditional uh, chemocentric approaches, where we look uh, um, exclusively at the intrinsic uh, properties of the exposure, uh, give only. Um, a limited amount of control over the system uh, for the fact that essentially they are neglecting the uh, the study of the of the uh, biological interactions uh, at the molecular level. And what we also believe is that uh, hopefully um, uh, an integrated approach where we consider along with the uh, chemocentric um, uh, properties of the exposure, also the biocentric properties of the exposure, that hopefully we can uh, gain uh, better uh, insights also uh, in terms of uh, designing uh, new chemicals. So in the first example here, I will discuss on, on some of the studies we've been doing, we are doing uh, for uh, trying to understand how much in vitro models can really um, uh, help us to inform of aspects that uh, otherwise, we would uh, need in vivo uh, models to investigate. So in this um, uh, bit older study that we published already a few years ago, um, I, uh, so basically we, <clears throat> we uh, compared an in vivo mouse lung model with an in vitro model of uh, human macrophages, both at the transcriptomic and phenotypic level, uh, uh, after exposure to uh, six different carbon nanomaterials. And uh, so basically here, the assumption is that when, if we look at the, at the transcriptome uh, and, and we look at the, at the ensemble of all the genes that are altered upon uh, a certain exposure, we would uh, define this set of molecules as the mechanism of action of of in this specific case of the nanomaterial. And our uh, goal here is uh, to further model this data in order to dissect specific trajectories of, um, uh, of specific genes and molecules that respond to uh, some, maybe a combination of intrinsic properties of the, of the uh, exposure. Uh, so interestingly, when we approached the modeling of this data by a, so to say, a traditional univariate approach where you traditionally from toxicogenomics data would analyze one gene at a time or one molecule at a time, we couldn't find striking similarities between in vivo and in vitro systems. As here you can see the gray area in this pie chart um, uh, signifying the number of genes that are non-common, uh, commonly altered by um, uh, by the in vitro and in vivo. At the same time, when on the same data, we applied a systems biology, uh, so to say, borrowed approach based on the uh, inference of, of uh, molecular networks, then we could indeed find um, a significantly large proportion of the mechanism of action of, of these nanomaterials that would um, uh, coincide between uh, in vivo and in vitro. Uh, now, a follow-up study on this was uh, 
quite quite nicely conducted by Pia Kinneret in my group and recently published uh, in the beginning of this year, uh, where basically we extended the the, the study of uh, human macrophages in vitro uh, to, um, um, to to the investigation of a number of of, uh, of molecular districts in the macrophages in response to carbon nanotubes, and we ended up with an integrated model where basically. Uh, we postulate that it's uh, it's um, it's a combination of the rigidity and the aspect ratio of the carbon nanotubes that would eventually govern the the, the polarization response of, of human macrophages either towards uh, M1, so pro-inflammatory, or otherwise M2 um, uh, regulatory um, uh, phenotype in, in macrophages. So in this second example, um, instead I would like to discuss how we are using toxicogenomics and integrated modeling to, to go beyond toxicity endpoints and trying to link directly uh, the exposure with, um, with human uh, diseases directly. So in this, in this um, uh, study published last year, um, we collected a significant amount of biosignatures of a number of nanomaterials as well as drugs, uh, chemicals and diseases and we um, uh, derived models that would basically suggest that um, uh, metal and metal oxide nanoparticles have strong similarities in, the, in their mechanism of action as um, uh, the alterations that, uh, molecular alterations that you will observe in the major uh, neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and ALS. Um, and by looking at by using the biomarkers that we derived from these um, from these predictions, we also set up a large panel of biochemical assay in vivo in a, in a, in a whole body um, uh, exposure uh, in zebrafish, and uh, we eventually could reconstruct AOPs uh, for these specific nano nanomaterials that would either affect the 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 central nervous tissues directly acting on the neurons. Or indirectly acting through the um, uh, interaction with glial cells, and uh, AOPs obviously are extremely central in in uh, in development of of uh, uh, alternative metals, but also in the development of Ayada. Uh, and 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 Penny after me will uh, will uh, certainly get uh, into this more in details. I just wanted to touch upon this. And tell a small exercise we have done this year. Um, uh, we're basically looking at the AOP. Um, we basically compared the AOP from um, known uh, to be uh, to take to take place during the uh, um, um, lung fibrosis uh, after uh, certain nanomaterials um, exposure into the lung, and the um, and the COVID nineteen. Um, uh, key events in um, in acute uh, response, and what we we found is that based on on the analysis of the key events in these two AOPs, we could um, um, uh, build a model where we basically uh, put an additional line here, suggesting that a long term effect of COVID nineteen could indeed uh, be lung fibrosis, and unfortunately, uh, the more we get into this pan uh, current pandemic, the more clinical data we uh, collect, we actually are um, unfortunately observing lung fibrosis indeed in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, with elder patients. All right, um, the last very few minutes, uh, this is going to be really short, is um, um, are going to be devoted to the description of the modeling data that uh, or the modeling efforts that we have done uh, in the context of the nano solutions. A project where basically we try to understand if we could gain more information when we go from a traditional QSAR approach where the toxicity effects are, fun are, are modeled as a function of the intrinsic properties of the exposure to a new integrated um, uh, modeling approach where the toxicity endpoints are instead um, um, uh, modeled as a function of both the intrinsic properties together with uh, mode of action uh, derived from from um, uh, toxicogenomics approaches. So in nano solutions, we studied 31 nanomaterials of industrial interest, 
And the whole consortium worked really hard for five years to uh, collect an enormous amount of information on these nanomaterials, not only on their intrinsic properties by fully characterizing them, but also uh, the, uh, the, the biological effects that these 31 materials was, were exerting both in vitro and in vivo and in a number of biological systems as well as collecting in, uh, in a multi-omics very much in-depth information on the mechanism of action. Well, long story short, our uh, analysis clearly suggests that uh, models that are comprising um, uh, multiple uh, data layers, so you can see here, uh, mRNA, microRNA, proteomics, intrinsic properties. So these models are clearly performing better in terms of um, prediction of toxicity uh, as compared to the uh, uh, approaches. And uh, you can see an overview here. Last slide, and uh, sorry for being uh, late. Uh, yeah. Just um, uh, just to remind us how data is. So in the context of the NanoSolve IT project, uh, we have collected basically all available uh, toxic genomic data for human mouse and rats uh, after nanomaterial exposure. And we found that a significant share of these either are not fair enough to be reused or they have some serious problems in the design. So just to say that good modeling is actually uh, deep, uh, fully dependent on, on the data. So the summary, um, um, we, we find that the molecular network inference can actually help the transition between in vitro and in vitro. When we contextualize the mechanism of action, we can actually go beyond toxicity and points towards human other therapies. And finally, that hybrid uh, modeling approaches uh, seem to be better than the Okay, yeah, we need to. Yes. yes. To, to Stop it now. Sorry to, to interrupt you, but uh, yeah, 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 I, yeah. So, so certainly you have to thank your collaborators. I understand also, uh, but people can see them. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, just one question. Yeah, you, you showed a lot of, of uh, data on 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 um, in vitro testing, for instance, and then uh, you have a lot of uh, toxicogenomic data. But is there not a danger that uh, looking too much to in vitro short time exposures that you miss uh, what is really happening uh, also in the gene tox, uh, genomic uh, data, uh, what is really happening in, on long term exposures? Yeah, definitely, absolutely. This is a this is a very crucial point, uh, and and uh, so our our uh, approach towards uh, going beyond this limit, this obvious limitation is to look at other districts of the molecular alterations in, in biological systems. We, uh, we have proof now that uh, epigenomics and epigenetic alterations are actually uh, very informative in terms of possible long-term effects of an exposure, even when you uh, look at uh, relatively short time points uh, in vitro. So, so uh, my personal understanding is that we should move more and more towards uh, multi-omics approaches, especially looking at uh, epigenomic um, uh, alterations. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that... Um, thank you. Yeah, I cannot uh, let any other question in, but I didn't see anything appear in the chat also from, from questions from the audience. So please, audience, if you have a question, try to type it into the chat uh, and then uh, we can pick it up during uh, the discussion. So I, I'm, yeah, we have a very tight time schedule as I, I notice now. So now uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Penny Nymark from Kalinsky Institute to give her presentation. Please, uh, Penny. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, so thanks to the organizers for um, inviting me here. I'm gonna, tell you a little bit about adverse outcome pathways and data integration within nano safety. So I'm Penny Nymark from, um, uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Institute of Environmental Medicine at Karolinska Institute here in Sweden. And um, so I'm gonna start, let me see if I can change slides. That's the way to go. Okay. So um, just a brief, I don't know, many of you might know all about, and you heard a little bit about adverse outcome path pathways already, 
But just to set the scene for my talk, I want to take you through the definition of an AOP. So an adverse outcome pathway is really a conceptual framework that portrays existing knowledge, and that's central to what I'm going to be talking about, uh, concerning biologically plausible key events and causally linked molecular initiating events to an adverse outcome. And um, these two latter uh, bold um, terms, biologically plausible and causality, is also very central to the AOP concept being so, um, or believed to take us beyond 21st or, or into 21st century toxic toxicity testing. So now data integration is of course very central to the AOP concept, especially since it's building on existing knowledge. And the AOPs really represent this continuum of development that we see within research. So uh, it really um, represents this. So AOPs are never really uh, finished. They continue to develop as we gain more existing, more available knowledge and understanding. And so AOPs can be uh, developed at different stages of maturity. They can be putative uh, at the very start where, I don't know, do you see my uh, pointer now? Can someone maybe confirm? I'm losing time, but <laughs> anyway, I'm hoping you see it. Um, it's the third button from the left and you can select, for example, the pencil. Oh, uh, right, I'm, I missed that point. There is a uh, private point and an official point. Okay. Maybe there. Here. Okay, now I think I have it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so AOPs uh, can be putative. They can be formal uh, or qual qualitative, and they can be quantitative. But having said that, they are never finished. They are always um, under development as existing knowledge increases. Now, when it comes to it seems to be that our presenter is gone from the system. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know if it's my internet or I, I lost the presenters, right? So, okay, but uh, going back to AOP applications. So uh, a, a specific uh, AOP's application is, is dependent on a case by case uh, determination of its fit for purpose. And that can depend on the level of de development. So early stage, uh, less mature AOPs are applicable at early stage risk assessment approaches or pre-regulatory risk assessment approaches, while the more mature AOPs are more applicable to YATAs, so integrated approaches to testing and assessment and more close to regulatory application. Now, um, going into uh, nano AOPs within nano safety. So uh, AOPs are stressor agnostic, and this is one of the most central principles of the AOP fram framework. They are always um, applicable to any stressor that uh, initiates the molecular initiating event. That having been said, uh, specific model stressors can still be used to develop AOPs. And that means that within the AOP or within nano safety, using uh, data from the nano safety realm is uh, applicable as model stressor data. 
which can then be used to develop AOPs, which naturally then become applicable to nano safety also. So this is a set of six uh, AOPs that were developed in jointly between the two projects, Patrols and Smart Nano Talks. And, um, and where you can see really um, MIEs that are very specific to nanomaterials, but do go beyond that if there would be a stressor that acts in similar modes of action as uh, nanomaterials. So these are uh, stressor agnostic, but, but applicable to nanomaterials and describe a set of lung injuries that are central uh, to nano safety and relevant to nanomaterials. So, um, but building on that, and this is something that Marvin will be talking more about after me. So not only is uh, nanomaterial data relevant to building AOPs applicable to nano safety, but also thinking, going back to the fact that we build on existing data, um, linkage with existing life science knowledge is equally important. And bringing in all that knowledge that has been gathered over decades of research from different types of uh, fields is equally uh, relevant to AOP development. So this is just briefly showing you how AOP Wiki, the, the central re repository for AOPs, is um, Marvin has linked it here to genes and pathways in the Wiki Pathway database, which means that you can then start enriching AOPs with molecular detail, pathway detail, and genes and, and links between genes and enabling then AOP coupled transcriptomics analysis. And this is something that, that um, is believed to really enrich the AOPs. Now, um, building on this uh, concept and this work, uh, we have also been working on a process, a, a so-called data fusion pipeline that builds um, or generates basically interactive bioinformatically useful AOP uh, linked molecular pathways. Now these pathways are expected to both uh, inform on central key biological processes and molecular players uh, involved in adverse outcomes. So really identifying biomarkers for key events and in addition, enabling broad development of broad coverage, high throughput and high content assays, in vitro assays that are able to detect these key uh, molecular players. And then allowing for a wide variety of AOP linked uh, data analysis during risk assessment. And for example, looking at AOP linked gene set analysis uh, gives you uh, an indication that that you're you're looking at bioinformatically and statistically tested uh, perturbation of uh, AOP link gene sets, giving you an indication that there's something going on in the in that specific AOP. And remember that these AOPs have the the inherent understanding of causality which really gives you a robust um, risk assessment. So, um, and then building further, so when it comes to AOP applicability, so this is a picture um, showing that we published a few, or in the beginning of this year, basically showing the process of um, uh, basically safe by design. So. In nano safety, of course, we've been working a lot. There's been big efforts towards uh, looking at early stage um, at risk assessment in the innovation process. So when you're developing nanotechnologies, you look at risk assessment already early during the very early phases of product development. Now, um, in this uh, effort, we then linked uh, new approaches, so NOMs, 
to these different stages and looked across different types of methods and how they fit in uh, to this process of pre-regulatory risk assessment, basically. In addition, we were looking at these uh, existing human risk assessment models that could accept information from new approach methodologies. Now, what you see is that AOPs really cover all these stages because they are so central for the data integration. So all of these previous methods here generate or they take into consideration existing data uh, and they also generate new data later in the stage gate process, so the innovation process. And what that means is that the AOPs come in and can support the systematic and structured organization of all this data. So, and this was this is really coupled to the application of data or of, of AOPs and supported by data integration. Now, something that we're still uh, figuring out is how to scale and score data for these dis different purposes. Okay, so going very fast to the last slide, I'm almost finished. Um, of course, uh, existing data needs to be available and there's huge efforts going into making data fair and really allowing uh, it to become findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And this is just a brief uh, mention of the nano safety data interface, which combines a lot of data from different projects. The nano reg two data is about to become public. Not sure it's not yet, but I think it should be soon. And in addition, we have a public omics metadata instance um, in this, uh, in this context. In addition, there's the new FAIR implementation network for nano safety, the advanced nano av uh, available to where you can look closer at the efforts going on and where you can join a community of uh, verifying nano safety data. So thank you, that was it for me. I have the acknowledgement slide and that's it. And so uh, Marvin has, um, is uh, going to come on after me, and he has some questions that we have put up together to um, ask you, basically, to make this a little bit interactive. And I'm guessing Marvin is going to have access now after me. Thank okay. you. Yeah. For that. Thank, thank you, uh, Penny. Um, I did not see any question appearing in the chat, or my chat is not uh, working. So please, people, where you have any remark question uh, noted down I, I've got one uh, small um, question about AOPs and, and and it's very useful in in, in hazard assessment and so on but um, is there also any effort going on uh, how to link in those levels into AOPs because you have yeah hazard but but only hazard is not uh, helping us to to go to safety evaluations. Yes, so that's a great question. And in fact, so of course you're very right, exposure is not part of the AOP, yeah. but exposure comes in very uh, early before you get into this. And we are uh, attempting to connect these two. And the last, or the next last figure that I showed the uh, safe by design slide actually has some uh, indications of that, of how we bring in exposure data to um, inform on the doses and the, the point of departure for these hazard assessment um, uh, approaches and in connection to AOPs. So this is really something that, uh, yeah, and especially within nano, nano safety, I think this is, I mean, of course it's important also for chemicals, but we do see uh, challenges with this because of the nano uh, material dosimetry issues that we're yeah, still yeah. facing. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I have to interrupt you because yeah, time is just too short. Uh, yes. It's yeah. very short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The very okay. first question was 
posed by Fleming Cassie in the chat box to me while we are still seeing our um, our survey running. Um, how about uh, species difference in AOP spenny? Yes, that's also a very interesting question. So at the moment, we are focusing a lot on humans. But as you, um, so AOPs come with an interesting principle, both the fact that they are um, stressor agnostic. So you can bring in data and information from other fields regarding uh, or other types of stressors. But not only, you can also go across species. So when it comes to um, the AOPs themselves, they're built out of modules. So each key event and each molecular initiating event and each AO is actually a, a module which can be isolated from its original a AOP <coughs> and um, brought into describing and looking at um, species across species effects so very conserved key events that do go across different species can be also refined to reflect these yeah. cross species effects yeah so, so sorry penny but yeah i really I have long uh, answers uh, so so yeah thank you very much penny for for this in very interesting talk and so now i uh, like to introduce um marvin to the stage uh, so he's going to give us showcasing the aop wiki resources description framework uh, why aops or nano aops do not exist so please marvin um yes thank you very much peter um in the meanwhile i already started up the um the questions that Penny submitted to me to, to ask to the viewers here. Um, I guess most people have already been filling them in. I see the, the questions filling in quite nicely here. You can all see the share screen, right? If I'm correct. I see quite some, some variety of questions in, but oxidative stress seems to be the, the highest number of, of entries here in this, uh, in this question of, of key events related to nanomaterials. I will quickly go to the last question of Penny that she had to the audience. If you want to comment, Penny, you can still. No, that's fine. It looks really, I'm ha super happy to see so many answers here. I wasn't sure what to expect if people would actually have ideas on this, but great. Um, so yeah, I will start my presentation in, in one minute. Um, I'll present mostly about the AOP wiki, as was already shortly introduced by Penny uh, just a minute ago, um, which uh, I transformed into a resource description framework, RDF, to make more easy access and interoperability of the database with other resources and other data. Um, yeah, I think I will just go, go into it right now, not to spend time. Or um, ah, okay, yes, perfect. Um, stop sharing screen, I guess. Okay, so um, thank you for joining. Thank you for asking me to present this. Um, like I said, I will present about the AOP wiki, so I skipped the whole introduction of adverse outcome pathways since it was already introduced twice now. Um, thank you for that, by the way, Peter and, and Penny. Um, so the AOP wiki, as said, is the central repository for adverse outcome pathways. It's mostly containing on uh, descriptive uh, text of mechanisms of action, basically the, the uh, description of uh, the collection of literature that describes uh, the molecular processes that occur upon uh, exposure to a stressor. And this is structured in these key events and key event relationships, of which there are over a thousand in the AOP wiki. Uh, building over 300 adverse outcome pathways. So it's a quite uh, extensive um, path already, uh, quite extensive database already, but it's growing very fast with many initiatives, trying to develop more and more efficient and more um, generic adverse outcome pathways to make them applicable to not only chemicals, which is in this moment, the majority, but also to nanomaterials, but other kinds of stresses as well. 
Um, so just like Penny, I also had some questions in the um, in the uh, um, presentation in Woo Club. Um, I already set this email or this email this URL in the bar in the uh, in the text box. So most people already I see already seventy people joined in that that URL. Um, and I was just curious how many people already had seen at any moment the AOP Wiki. Do you know it? Have you ever searched for information inside of it? And I see, I guess, wait, let me just share again. Oh, share. Um, my fault. So I see the, the majority has never seen the AOP Wiki. Um, but also quite a lot of people, 28% has seen it at some point. And some people never heard of the AOP Wiki. No, now you have. Um, this is the AOP Wiki, but what I'm going to show now is basically a transformed version of the AOP Wiki. Then this maybe relates, this is not a question, maybe relates to the one that already was asked by Penny, but what kind of things would you look for in an adverse outcome pathway wiki? What kind of um, things would you try to enter in this database to find information about your nanomaterial or your uh, process of interest related to nanomaterials? Um, chemical name, cast number, I see nanomaterial. Interesting, mostly mostly on the stressor related, not so much on the adverse outcome specific. Cellular fates. I, 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 I'm storing all of these answers because I, these are very interesting answers. So I'm very happy that you are all so actively filling these in. Um, going back at the presentation. Somehow it switches um, back to the, the main presentation every time. I'm, I'm probably doing that wrong. Yes, thank you. Um, so basically we build the adverse outcome pathway wiki uh, resource description framework to increase, to improve its interoperability with other databases, add more identifiers for both chemicals and genes and allow uh, interoperability and, and accessibility increase by services by tools and also by using metadata and specific uh, uh, topic specific ontologies to make the, the vocabulary used in this database more more consistent and more widely used so there's a few there's a few ways to use the aop wiki rdf uh, one of them is the regular sparkle endpoint uh, which is um, a place where you can use Sparkle Query, which is a, a query language to extract data from resource description framework data, um, which I will just show very briefly in a minute. Um, another example that I will show is an API built on top of uh, Sparkle Endpoint with using GitHub, a code repository. And um, this also allows you to use AOP wiki content or query and extract AOP wiki content using coding environments such as Jupyter Notebooks. And finally, I will briefly show a screenshot of recent developments on a Sparkle Explorer interface that we've been working on. So very roughly said, if you know that AOP wiki um, currently has very limited options of exploring the data, um, this RDF allows you to basically enter any type of question that you want as long as you know a little bit of the, the sparkle query language um or know how to use one of the uh, or adapt the questions that we already made and um this allows you to extract for example in this case uh, all key events all aops and all um information that is related to fibrosis. I was expecting one of the adverse outcomes to be fibrosis since that was one of the main focuses of, of Penny's work earlier. Um, and this is just a screenshot of what comes out of a query like this, where you um, search for any key event or any adverse outcome that has the word fibrosis and then gets you the data back. Um, well, I have only a few minutes left. <clears throat> Like I said, the um, garlic interface, this is a 
application programming interface built on top of a uh, GitHub repository with preloaded Sparkle queries. So there you don't have to know the Sparkle query language, but you can directly uh, enter your variables or enter your <clears throat> enter your uh, um, uh, call basically and get the results back in the very same way. You can do this in various formats. And also this is um, usable through command line or through coding environments as well, which is what I show very briefly here. This is the example of how to use both of them. So on the left side, the AOP wiki RDF, the Sparkle endpoint, and on the right side, the uh, garlic UI. And um, this is just very simple examples, but this is the same question that I had before where I want to know all of the key events that have the word fibrosis in the title, uh, basically looking at all the adverse outcomes that are part of that. And then the question on the right side, the, the, the bunch of code on the right side, is basically extracting the AOPs of which these um, um, uh, adverse outcomes are a part. In this case, only the first one is shown. And you can do a lot of nice of modeling with this kind of uh, approaches where you can really quickly generate AOP networks or AOP um, information. You can you can model it in any way uh, um, how you like. And this is very, very efficient and very fast and, and it saves you a lot of time looking through many, many pages in the AOP wiki, which is currently the way how to do this. Or if you are good with XML, you can parse it. The next thing, which is still under development mostly, so there's no URL yet, uh, is, is work done mostly by Amar Amar, who will also present later today, uh, on the Snorkel user interface, where basically the, the Sparkle queries are already preloaded into a UI where you can still adapt these queries and um, reuse basically all the questions that we already put in the GitHub repository that is used to load all these all these questions. Um, Marvin, uh, still two minutes. Two and minutes. Then ten o'clock. I have three slides left. I will step. I will skip my my next question. Um, <clears throat> well, maybe I can just. I will open the question, but I will not show it on the screen. Um, so the question is open on on Google. Um, so what makes nanomaterials so tricky for, for adverse outcome pathways? Well, as described, AOPs are chains from key of key events from any molecular initiating event to any adverse outcome. So a nanomaterial specific molecular initiating event can still be called uh, a, an AOP specific adverse outcome pathway since it's this chain that only starts with this particular molecular initiating event. But they are supposed to be developed chemical agnostic or stressor agnostic, being more generic than your general mode of action, more wide, widely uh, 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 usable. Also, the uh, uh, physiochemical properties of, of nanomaterials vary very much, even with the same uh, elemental composition, they can be having very, very different effects in the biological system, leading to some um, yeah, problems in reproducibility of the kind of data that is produced or being generated or information that is taken out of it. I have two slides left. Um, so I did a short um, um, exercise looking into the AOP wiki, what is already there in terms of nanomaterial related information. And in terms of stressors, only eight out of the almost 500 stressors are describing nanomaterials or nanomaterial like uh, um, stressors. Of course, this is not done automatically. You cannot read all the 900 of them and I just ex uh, expect that they are nanomaterials. This is just um, because they are not annotated. There is no annotation existing for uh, uh, these kind of nanomaterials, which is, is lacking in this database. Last slide. Um, Another exercise looked into all of the AOPs themselves, all of the AOPs, all of the key events and all of the key event relationships. And if any of these have some description of nanomaterials, I would include it in uh, a large data frame, which eventually led to, to this one that you see right here, um, which is, like I mentioned before, I see some fibrosis related pathways, but also some cancer pathways, which I did, uh, did see show up in the word cloud before, uh, which is confirming and then I'm very curious to look at the answers afterwards to, to see what kind of other things that are there. Okay, thank you. This was my first
very rapid presentation. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. It's uh, it's clear that the, the block of 15 minutes is just not enough to, to get really through uh, the key points. Uh, um, I, I saw a few questions. One, and, and you answered uh, partly, I think, um, is about uh, does AOP wiki cover uh, chemical biological interactions? Um, well, stressor uh, interactions. Um, yeah. Indeed, there is some chemicals described in there, over 400, I would say, uh, or chemical groups and how they interact with the biological system. But this is also uh, still an, an issue with the AOP Wiki. It's still very much on the development. So most of the adverse outcome pathways that are there do not contain very elaborate information on these interactions themselves. OK. Yeah, and I'm it's sorry. It's descriptive as well. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to, yeah, I have to, to stop it here. Otherwise, there is no time for any break. But I think that Martin uh, still has a, a short announcement because he has something in, in the chat also. And he maybe can take over and go to the next uh, session. First of all, thank you very much, Peter, Marvin, Penny, and Dario for these really great uh, insights. What we tend to do today is get an insight into the things, make people know who are the specialists in these fields are, and connect people. And we will for sure, um, within our activities of the Nano Safety Cluster Working Group A, but as well as uh, from the Nano Commons project, which is a community building project and uh, takes a lot of training initiatives in, in, in these emerging tools and understandings and, understandings and concepts offer further training events to get in more detail, to get in more depth. We have next week anyway, a training event. Um, the AOP Wiki is not training uh, among these training events next week, next Monday, but we will for sure organize something. There is obviously an interest. We also connect these two molecular initiating events. Um, so stay tuned to our working group mailing list, subscribe there, and you get all this information in future. Thanks very much to the presenters and thanks so much, Peter, for um, driving really people uh, being within the time frames and we have a few minutes rest. So take, uh, move your bones a bit. It's a, it's a long day. It's going to be a long day. Take some, some zip of fresh air or give, you, give yourself a cool drink, maybe a coffee or something else. Uh, we will continue in a few minutes um, with um, session two. So while we have looked now much, much into hazard assessment, what is emerging here, we are going to look into exposure assessment and exposure determination uh, in the next session. We also want to carry this to life cycle uh, assessment. We want to cover the entire life cycle of materials in future. This is very important for a safe environment. You have seen in my introductory slides, I'm also a member of the Scientists for Future. This is really something that I um, very much uh, con uh, am con convinced about, that we need to um, get this really now to the application, all these concepts. So we start in a few minutes. I will just change the slides and uh, invite the new speakers.
break, everybody. We're looking now into the session two, exposure and life cycle assessment, determination and modeling. Um, I am very happy that we have Walter Franzmann, the working group leader of working group C uh, here as the session chair. And um, over the microphone to you, Walter, please um, go ahead with the session. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay, and if you can put my slides on, thank you. So, so welcome to this session two in this, in this block one, which is in, on exposure assessment and, and life cycle assessment. And if you go to the next slide, can I, can I click slides myself? Yes. Yeah, here's the agenda for today's one hour session. So I will give a very brief introduction, mainly in, into the aims and the objectives of, of working group C. Uh, then we have a very interesting presentation on, on extrapolation of exposure data, followed by one from Camilla on, on sharing of, of data. Uh, then we have a presentation by Henk Goede on efficiency testing of risk management measures. And we end this session uh, with a presentation by Nathan on lifecycle thinking. Next slide, please. So, the, so to give you a very short introduction on working group C, uh, uh, because it was quite a large working group, we decided to subdivide the working group C into four subgroups. Uh, the main topic of today's session is mainly in, in working group C1, which is on human exposure and is chaired by myself. But there's also a working group on human hazard, working group C2. And then there's one on environmental exposure, working group C3, chaired by Klaus and Soko. And the fourth one is on eco toxicology. So if you're not familiar with the, with the working group structure, please visit the, the Nano Safety Cluster website if you haven't done so. And there you can find a full overview of what the working groups do and also the possibility to, um, uh, to sign up for the, for the newsletter and the, uh, and the mailing list. So just in short, the Working Group C uh, uh, has several objectives, which is mainly overarching over the different uh, projects in the Nano Safety Cluster. So it's there to encourage the sharing of project methods and, and techniques, as well as technical best practices to, to analyze and characterize nanomaterials. To encourage the sharing of project data, and, and Camila will, will give a short presentation on that today. And of course, also the dissemination in, in collaboration with Working Group A, uh, uh, all the initiative that Martin takes, uh, including this one today, is, is there uh, to try and, and spread the word on exposure assessment and hazard assessment. So the current activities and plans that we have are, are ongoing. We have a uh, within the SEN um, NOAA mandate, we have a round robin testing going on on nanomaterial characterization by electron microscopy, as well as the, the testing of local sensors to be able to detect nanoparticles. We contribute to the, to the Malta project and various OECD activities to, to come up with technical guidelines. We stimulate the harmonization of, of data collection in collaboration with Working Group F on databases. And we develop and agree new research priorities uh, within the EU. We have contributed in our, and are still contributing to the US-EU uh, collaborations, with our, which are fit into the communities of research, uh, in which we try to stimulate the joint activities between the US and, and, and the EU. And we, and we have a, a similar dialogue with the, with the Asia part uh, in which the nanoparticles are, 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 are studied. We have discussions with the ECRs on the view of being involved in the direction of the, of the working group. Uh, we try to interact uh, towards the nano and microplastics fields, which seem to be an, an, an emerging field where we have our interest. And we transfer the knowledge that we have built in, in exposure assessment and hazard assessment into two new areas in, in the nano safety cluster, which are the safe by design strategies is one, and nano risk governance is, is the second. So you, you may note that the exposure and hazard assessment working group was very active in the beginning of the nano safety cluster, in which all was to do on, on how to assess the exposure and the hazard of nanomaterials. 
but that was 20 years ago and now we have really evolved in the in the new fields of safe by design and, and risk governance uh, by by keeping all the good work that we did in in exposure and, and asset assessment so this was basically it for for my very brief introduction and i would like to introduce the first speaker which is uh, Remy Franke, uh, my, my colleague from, from TNO, and he will give a presentation on extrapolation of, of exposure measurement data. So, Martin, please, can you please change the slides? And, Remy, the floor is yours. Remy, are you there? Can you please unmute yourself and start your presentation? Martin, can you please uh, unmute uh, Remy? Uh, Remy is unmuted from our uh, capabilities. Remy, you have to press the red button underneath the face of Walter. And then you can speak. There is a microphone in the middle of these three buttons in red, which you need to click, and then you can talk up. I see that Remy has, has left, so he may have some, some connection problems. I propose that we, that we um, move on to the next presenter, which is Camila, and then try to come back to, to Remy afterwards. Camila, can you please try and unmute yourself and see if it works? Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you. Uh, so, so please, uh, 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 Camila, she works in Laetat in, in Spain. She's from Italy originally, and she will present uh, uh, in 15 minutes the, the sharing of release and exposure measurement data. Please go ahead, uh, Camila. Thank you, Walter. So as you have uh, heard just now, I'm, uh, I'm going to show you some of the work that we did, uh, and that goes in the direction of uh, an improvement of the sharing of the data, especially the one on the release and exposure measurement. So here you have an outline of this presentation. Uh, first, I'm going to refresh you a bit the concept of release and exposure. Then I will give you a short introduction on the Gracious project and on the input that we give for the nanoform release and exposure. Then I'm going to go a bit more in depth in, uh, in the development of a release and exposure library. And for this, we, we were also working on, on some template and on a wiki. And this will be also shown in this presentation. And finally, we will give uh, some, uh, some conclusion and, uh, and some next step. So uh, here you have um, a brief refresh on, uh, on what we mean for release. And uh, here we mean the liberation of a nanoform during a natural or a technical process that can happen at any life cycle stage. Then we have a mission, uh, which is the transfer of this uh, released nanoform to a compartment where it can reach a receptor. And in this case, we have also the transmission event. And finally, uh, we can have exposure when the nanoform come into contact uh, with the body of a receptor and possibly could enter a, into the receptor body through an exposure route. And here I want to point out that uh, all these events are, uh, are linked between them and one cannot take place if the previous one does not happen. And now let's go uh, more into detail uh, on the project in which uh, we were working. And uh, this is uh, the project is Gracious, in which uh, the aim is to develop a, a science-based uh, framework to enable practical application of grouping and read across and uh, for nanomaterial. And our input into this grouping framework was uh, related to the release and exposure 
and in specific uh, to the intended use and exposure scenarios along the life cycle of the nanoform and non-enabled product on grouping hypothesis basing on the nanoform release and exposure and on the development of a release and exposure library, which will be, uh, let's say, the main topic of this talk. But before to go ahead, I would like you to make you uh, a couple of questions. And uh, here you see a quite uh, basic uh, question, uh, and is uh, about if you know a database or a data library dedicated to the release and exposure data, and if yes, if this is publicly available. And then uh, the other question is, uh, if you know any, any template in which you can collect this kind of data, and uh, if yes, if this template, uh, again, are publicly available. This is just a, a, a quick, let's say, question that uh, we were asking to ourselves before to start, actually. Okay, I think uh, maybe we can come back because I know that we are short on time to the presentation. I don't know if... Uh, I think you mute yourself. I you guess. Know. Yeah, the results, maybe we should wait a bit more to have a look. But I guess that, yeah, the results will be more or less what we get. So, uh, what we think was, okay, uh, to, to develop this release and exposure library, uh, we should need uh, some data. We need, of course, a template, and, uh, and then we need... Uh, uh, also a kind of database and, uh, and a place where to, to put this data. But at the top of our knowledge, this was not, uh, not available. And I guess that, our, that your results, your answer will be more or less in this direction. At the moment, we have got 30 people who have voted, and Camila, you let me know how long I shall let it yeah. run. Yeah, let's have a look. Let's have a look already. Thank okay. you, Martin. For end voting with 31 submitted, 35 submitted. Um, okay, I guess that not all the audience maybe uh, will have the need, and uh, yeah, maybe it's not exactly the topic, but... So you have uh, quite some no, uh, and, uh, and also some yes, actually, but mainly no. So as in our case, it was not, uh, not easy to, to find out a database or a data library with this kind of release and exposure data. And then what we find were, of course, were not uh, available publicly. So we get more, more or less the same feeling than you. And then, uh, again, the template were not available, doesn't exist, nothing about this. And, uh, and maybe there was something about the exposure, but, uh, but this was more, uh, how to say, a private uh, kind of format, and we were not uh, uh, having access to, to this. Okay, thank you. We can come back to the presentation. So it's just to demonstrate that actually we were actually in the same... Uh, in the same condition, and we say, okay, we need to develop this library, we need to find data, we need uh, a place to, to store this data, and this was the InanoMapper database, but of course we need some template, some format to collect the data, and we need also uh, some uh, description of the terminology. And so uh, this was the situation, the data were available, we were able to find library, reviews, literature paper, but there was no um, an available template and no common terminology. And so we decided to, to go and, and develop uh, a template and, uh, and also uh, some section in, the, in a wiki that was developed inside the project. In this slide, you see, uh, we developed uh, two different templates. Uh, one uh, that is the occupational release and exposure, the other template, and the other one, the environment and consumer release template, the PCR. Both template, uh, as you see, provide, uh, can, um, can um, accommodate data on the nanoform and nano-enable product release potential and on the EKUs descriptors. Then for the use activity, in the ORE, we want to collect data uh, on activity and uses that can cause an emission or, or a release in an uh, indoor uh, compartment 
And on the other case, uh, for the ACR, we want to collect data that are going, uh, that are coming from a release that go to the outdoor compartment. Then the applicable life cycle stages for the ORE were um, the one, let's say, related to the occupational settings. And uh, in the other case, for the SCR, we were collecting, uh, able to collect data on the life cycle stages. So uh, also uh, for the compartment affected, the ORE was, uh, was more focused on the indoor air, indoor surfaces, and also bio compartment while the SER was more for the outdoor compartments, so the air, the soil, the waters, and of course also for the bio compartments. The supposed population uh, for the ORA template were mainly the worker, and uh, for the SER were uh, the consumer, the environment, and also the species and organism living in. And in both cases, we were able to accommodate the data on the three uh, main route of exposure, inhalation, dermal, and oral. In this other table, you can see that, uh, for example, most of the section uh, of the two templates are common. Uh, for example, for the release potential of the nanoform, uh, we have similar sections, which are the nanoform chemistry, physical chemical characteristic, matrix characteristic, and AKU descriptors. Uh, then the activity and use release potential. Also, we have same section, activity characteristic, release and exposure factor, and a summary of these uh, release uh, results. And here you see uh, this is the only section which is present just in the ORE template, which is more related to the exposure potential. And uh, here we have information on the contributing exposure scenarios, uh, exposure control measure, premises, and, uh, and also a summary of these exposure measurement results. And again, we have a common section in this two template uh, about uh, the reference of the paper and the, the quality of the data. One minute left, uh, Camilla. Okay, so I think I will go very, very fast. Here you see these templates are uh, in, a, in a nomadper. You can enter, you will be able to go in the template wizard and, uh, and download the template on the release or the exposure one. And here uh, is just an overview of the template. You have a first uh, worksheet uh, where you have uh, some introduction to the template, uh, which are the worksheet available, information on who entered the data and the version of the template. And then uh, here I want to show you briefly um, the, the core of the template, so the place where you're gonna enter your data. And here we have the nanoform chemistry information, for example, the core, the shell, and uh, some code uh, for identifying the nanoform. And then, for example, we have another section for the physical chemical characteristic, so size, shape, uh, crystalline phase, ele elemental composition, and then uh, matrix characteristic, uh, type of the matrix, content of the nanoform in the matrix. And then we have a section for the ECAUSE descriptor that uh, furnish some uh, contextual information. So life cycle stage, sector of use, uh, product category, environmental release categories. And then we have a section more related to the release. So the activity which was performed, the protocol of release, if uh, there is a reference to an ISO standard. And then we have again a factor affecting release. So which are the population affected, which is the duration of the activity, the frequency. And then we have a big section uh, for the release experiment results. So the amount of the release, which kind of particle were released, which uh, was the composition, the size, shape of this particle. And finally, yes, reference and, and a quality that was uh, calculated. But I guess I'm a bit on uh, short on time. So here is just uh, mentioning that we uh, select some, uh, some of the entry, the most important according to us, then we uh, we assign a weighting factor to this entry, and finally, we calculate uh, an overall uh, quality for, for the data entry. And then, very quickly, we, we were working also on some section of a wiki, and uh, here I was showing you the, the one related to the ECAUSE descriptor. And actually, what we have in the template, here you see the section of the descriptor, is also reported in the, in the wiki, and each of the entries is explained. And also all the options uh, that we have, for example, in this entry, 
that uh, the user could select has got also an explanation in the wiki so that the, the user will be uh, yeah, guided and will be easy for him or her to, to fill the template. And here there were other questions, but I guess that uh, we will have time to go through it. So I, I pass quickly to the conclusion. And uh, actually we were generating uh, two templates to collect uh, and store release and exposure data. We described and explained that the, the, the terminology used in this template, and uh, we build a release and exposure library by filling this template. And the next step will be to populate with even more data this uh, release and exposure library, and to make both the template and the release library publicly available uh, for uh, all, the, all the community of the nano safety. And uh, yeah, this is all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Camila, for this excellent presentation. Uh, we're running a bit short on time due to some te technical difficulties in the beginning. So I propose that if you have any questions, put them in the chat and, and hopefully Camila uh, can answer them there in the chat. And that goes for all the other presentations as well. Uh, Remy, yeah, please sure. try to make your presentation in, in, in 10 minutes time, if, if possible. Yes, yeah, sorry. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I will be presenting uh, of a project we just completed called Extrapolating the Applicability of Worker Exposure Measurement Data, which is a fancy term for uh, read across of exposure data. Um, this project uh, was, a, was a collaboration between TNO, HSE, Triscalion and was funded by CEFIC LRI. Um, so, currently in exposure assessment, uh, the golden standard approach uh, is, is still measuring exposure and, and is based on uh, representative measurements. Um, so, what's representative, uh, meaning that uh, you measure in multiple companies or multiple sites for multiple workers and uh, repeated measurements uh, per worker. In practice, the vast majority of exposure assessments are not done by measuring data. Um, but uh, since, since a single substance alone may require uh, many exposure assessments due to all possible uh, combinations uh, which have an influence on exposure, and therefore exposure models were developed and play an important role to fill these data gaps. Uh, we differentiate between screening tools such as eStock TRA and higher tier models such as uh, ART or uh, Stoffer Manager. And the objectives of this project was to develop an approach which enables uh, the use of existing measurement data more extensively than, than currently is being done. Um, and it must be noted that this approach was developed for conventional chemicals, so not nanomaterials, but we'll come back uh, later on how this might be useful for nanomaterials. Um, so the idea was that uh, you could apply corrections as necessary to account for differences, differences between a source and a target scenario where a source scenario in this case means uh, an existing data set and a target scenario is uh, a user case scenario where no measurements are uh, currently available and the approach uh, should be user friendly. So we developed a hybrid modeling and measurement approach uh, that can supplement existing exposure models uh, an ex estimate of exposure is based on existing measurement data from a similar source scenario and what similar means we'll come back to that uh, later too and then corrections can be applied to account for differences between uh, existing data sets and uh, a company situation where no data is available and the approach uh, has developed on the same theory of exposure determinants, which are used in models such as East of TRA and ART. So it's a multi-step approach uh, where one uh, first would check the quality of the source data set he wants to use for the read across. Um, Next, when the source data set is of sufficient quality, uh, one would make an inventory or mapping of the differences uh, for relevant read across parameters between the source and the target situation. 
then in the next step a statistical correction is applied uh, to correct for the differences between the source data set and the uncertainty of uh, of the estimate is is quantified and uh, well again the read across results are are to be uh, shown in a user friendly way for users so in step one uh, we uh, which I do not expect you can read, but it shows you that there are several questions with regards to the technical aspects of the data set, so sampling strategies, uh, analytical methods used, and questions about uh, contextual information. So the exposure, well, uh, is the substance uh, well described, the concentrations in the product articles, are the activities well described, what's the scale, the duration, etc. Um, and for if uh, an answer is no to one of the questions, some alternatives are offered. So, if the concentration is not known, for example, uh, you you might reasonably assume a concentration. Um, then, in the mapping approach, this is basically where you uh, look at the differences between your situation and the uh, data set. Uh, which you want to use for extrapolation. So in this figure, you can see, uh, let's say, for example, you have a target situation, uh, both at toluene. In your case, uh, you, you use a fraction of 20% in the source data, it was pure. Uh, you want to use LAV in the source data, there were no controls, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then uh, when, when all the differences are mapped, uh, we developed a small rule base which governs which extrapolations from the source to target uh, is supported by the framework. So you can't take a random set and 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 uh, well make all the extrapolations you need. And there needs to be a certain amount of similarity between the sets. Then you have your statistical correction, uh, which is applied. So a read across score is calculated by an algorithm which we developed. Um, uh, and the read across scores take into account the emission potential, the dispersion factors, localized control uh, concentration. And um, the emission potential has been calibrated using a large data set. So a small correction has been applied on that. Uh, and uh, if you follow that, you you would get the final read across score uh, with with, uh, with with your uncertainty quantified uh, around that. So does uh, does it work the theory which we described? Well, in two projects um, we have tested the developed framework quite extensively. Uh, we have first developed five initial case studies. Um, on which we tested the, the framework, and these five case studies uh, comprised of in total around 30 extrapolations. Then we made, based on those results, some refinements to the framework, and, and we, we, we fine-tuned it a bit. And then we added five additional, uh, more challenging case studies uh, to test uh, the refined read-across approach. So we used uh, single sources and multiple target scenarios within each case study and uh, different ranges of activities and substances, substance classes were studied. So ga gases, powders, volatiles, non-volatiles. Uh, we covered a very broad range of that. And in the figure, you can see uh, the, the, the measured uh, a geometric mean from the source data set uh, compared to the predicted geometric mean uh, to the extrapolated data set. Uh, no normally you wouldn't know these uh, these values of course because you don't have data there but uh, within the case studies we, we did have measurements and we extrapolated to scenarios where we could compare our predictions with uh, the measurements in the that set. So uh, this has been developed for conventional chemicals. Um, would it work with nanomaterials? Uh, since we are on the nano conference here, 
I don't know. I haven't tried it yet. Um, would I try it? I would first test the existing approach uh, with a data set uh, or case studies which contained exposure measurements to nanomaterials. And if that works, then the answer is, of course, simply yes, it would work for nanomaterials. Um, if the results are not as promising, then probably some extra determinants need to be considered uh, within the frameworks. For example, the particle size may be more of relevance for nanomaterials, aggregation or agglomeration, uh, maybe additional activities are uh, not covered in the current framework, uh, which uses procs or activity classes. Maybe different uh, nano-specific exposure models can be used to underpin the read across framework. Uh, we don't know. Current calculation uh, is partly calibrated, so possibly the approach needs to be recalibrated uh, on the data set with nanomaterials to make it more accurate. Um, and as mentioned before, we use East of TRA and ART to underpin uh, the rules of extrapolation. So maybe we need different models for that. Uh, and uh, lastly, the thing uh, we, we need to do is we, we develop the theory and we showed proof of concept of this theory and it shows promising results. Um, but we have mentioned user-friendly quite some time and, and now the next step should also be to, to, uh, to develop a user-friendly IT tool which can hold the IDs and the rules of this framework and makes it easier to work with. So in a nutshell, that was uh, my presentation about uh, read across. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Remy, and, and, and thanks for, for, for keeping it short. Uh, we, we're still a bit behind schedule, so I propose that we proceed. And please, again, to remind you, you can put questions in the chat and, and the, uh, the presenters are happy to, to answer them. So next presentation is by Henk Goede uh, on the, uh, the effectiveness and, and implementation of risk management measures. Hang, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Wouter. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Okay, please, please try to, to present in 10 minutes also, if possible. Yeah. Hang. yeah, all right, no problem. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'll give you a presentation about uh, the efficiency testing and implementation of uh, risk management measures to uh, mitigate exposure to nanomaterials. Um, just want to see if I can. Oh, all right. Just a moment. I just want to see if I can change this. I can't see my slides properly. All right. That's better. Um, so, just for introduction. Um, uh, as you all know, with the increasing use of nanomaterials, um, there's a quite a need to ensure safe use in, in occupational settings. So this presentation will be about risk management measures in uh, occupational settings. And um, so we're looking at uh, mitigating re and reducing exposure to, to um, nanomaterials using uh, RMMs. Um, so what do we need for risk assessment and modeling uh, purposes? Um, we need more information about the RMMs that can be used or control measures that can be used in the workplace. Um, and the criteria that's needed in terms of design of those uh, um, control measures, and also the quantitative effectiveness of those controls. Uh, and in doing so, we can uh, then better implement um, control measures uh, in the workplace and provide uh, recommendations on that. Uh, so there's been quite a number of uh, projects that uh, dealt with this topic, um, especially uh, also in the, uh, in the US, for example, NIOSH, but also in the EU, um, like OBCD and uh, Life, uh, Life uh, Nano Risk Sun uh, Guide Nano Project. Um, so there's a need um, to really integrate evidence that we do have on um, risk management measures and um, how to implement them and provide guidance for that. Um, and that's um, something that has already begun and you do have some guidance at the moment, but not sufficient um, and that needs to be upgraded in the future. Right, so just to give you an idea of, I wanted to 
explain a little bit more about why wouldn't we just use the, for example, the effectiveness values um, of um, risk management measures uh, in occupational settings for conventional sciences? And why would we bother to even look at uh, nanomaterials specifically? Now, on the left, uh, in the left-hand corner, you can see uh, the typical pathways that's being used for uh, in occupational settings or occupational hygiene. It's looking at uh, the emission of a non-material or a substance, the transmission, and then the emission to towards a worker or to towards a receptor. And along those different pathways, you have um, control measures such as uh, for the emission uh, process control or product modification. Uh, for transmission, you're looking at uh, localized controls, um, dispersion controls, etc. And for emission, you're looking, for example, at um, um, respirators that are being used. I just want to use my pointer here. Um, so on the right-hand corner, um, these are processes of nanomaterial mechanisms that you also have to consider. If you look at diffusion properties of, of nanomaterials, uh, you can imagine that if you if there's a in synthesis you have a release of nanomaterial material um, uh, along this way there will be coagulation um, aggregation of of, of nanoparticles um, and that will also affect the effective effectiveness of different control measures so that's something we have to um, consider here um, on a more bird's eye view of prioritization of controls um, what we distinguish typically is we're looking at the safe by, uh, safe by material design approach. So if you have the, the um, uh, occupational hygiene um, hierarchy uh, of, of using controls. So at the top of the pyramid, uh, use elimination and substitution. So that's the most preferred way and the most effective way, obviously. Um, what I'll be talking uh, mostly about is the safe uh, by process design. So then you're looking at uh, engineering controls to control, uh, for example, at, uh, at the source uh, or along the pathway all the way to the, the, the worker. Um, and then the personal um, protective equipment, I also discussed that a little bit uh, in this presentation. And later, in the uh, last slide, I'll, I'll talk more, a little bit more about the SAP uh, material design. Right, this, is, uh, this was meant to be shown with uh, some, <laughs> um, um, I'll just start talking about the modern left-hand side here. Uh, I just want to indicate the differences in, in theory and practice and um, how can we actually use information from, um, for example, intervention studies. Uh, if you look at engineering controls uh, and protective equipment, if you look at the theory behind uh, what is happening with, uh, with nanomaterials, um, if they, for example, being, um, if you apply, for example, local exhaust ventilation, um, then you can, you, you realize that the diffusion is a, a very important um, 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 property that should be included, that should be considered here. Um, and the same for, for, for respirators, uh, for the collection, um, efficiency of, of filters. Um, so if you consider the different um, theories around how effective um, nanomaterials will be, for example, extracted to, in a ventilation system, uh, in this case, will be from 200 to 300 will be quite effective, but smaller than that might still be effective if your ventilation system is uh, uh, strong enough uh, to extract it. Um, and it's interesting for respirators, for example, that uh, your mo most penetrating particle size will be uh, probably around 300 nanometers. Um, whereas what's interesting is that uh, in, in studies that's already been done is that uh, very small particles uh, sizes of, let's say, between 10 and 80 nanometer are uh, very um, effectively being um, uh, intercepted and, and collected in um, filter systems. Um, but what we want to say here in this slide is that uh, there's still insufficient information about how effective uh, different control systems are. Um, you, got, you cannot only use uh, the theory behind it um, when you start doing tests, for example, a study um, shown here by, by Tai et al. Um, for containment systems. Um, you see there's a, quite a variation in the effectiveness of control measures.
You have three minutes left, sir, Hank, so please try to speed up a bit. All right. All right, so in terms of uh, RMM testing, there's a lot of uh, EU projects that, uh, that dealt with this uh, topic. Um, and in most cases, the um, uh, you've got for, for R RPE, for example, for respirators, they use a, a protection factor or a total inward leakage uh, for, for engineering controls, um, uh, just a pre and a post test. Um, so what we've done in the past is to, to convert all of that to a percentage of effectiveness of a, a control measure. Um, and you can derive it from different studies, from uh, varied experimental studies to, to um, cross-sectional studies by using models. Um, and um, uh, this uh, upstream, uh, upstream and downstream test for um, closing um, and, and respirators. So we've done a literature review on um, on the effectiveness of control measures. Uh, this is just a slide showing the engineering controls. And our conclusion from the study was that um, we still do have very limited information about the effectiveness uh, values of, of controls. Um, although what we found was engineering controls are very similar uh, in the findings of, of the studies we, uh, on, for example, um, localized control. Uh, such as um, LEV systems um, and respiratory protective equipment as well. Although uh, you can see that filtering phase pieces are often um, not very effective, or not effective enough for non-materials. Um, so what have we done um, since then? Uh, we developed an um, exposed control library. Um, it was part of a CEFIC uh, LRI B13.3 project. Um, so we added all this data in this database as well. So you can easily search for it and you can find the database uh, um, at this web website. Um, and you can search for different uh, occupational and environmental RMMs actually. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the control measures for, for the occupational setting. Um, so there's uh, different uh, uh, sources in there and one of the sources are specifically uh, for non-materials. So just quickly going through the different um, 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 screens or user interfaces you can find in ESL. You can search, for example, for nanomaterials and search for different types of uh, control measures. Uh, for example, in this case, capturing hoods, containment and enclosing hoods. Uh, then you can first see which ones are the most effective or what is the variability in, uh, um, in a different um, control measures. Um, if you choose one, for example, in this case, you choose fume covers, you can also select different records which are uh, relevant in your case. You can go to eCard and find more information and see if it's relevant for your specific uh, exposure scenario. Um, and then if you, when you select it, you can also do analysis and see how effective it is actually. Um, and it gives you a, a median um, exposure level based on the records you selected and also the variability, so the 95% uh, uh, high density uh, interval. One minute, Hank. Uh, right. right. All right, so in terms of RMA effectiveness, um, I've already shown that to you. Um, it's, you know, it's very important that it's ongoing research in this, in this case, and we have to populate databases uh, even more and get more information. Uh, I'm not going to into details here, but this is also very important to include in um, um, to include uh, RMM testing uh, information and the study types that's being included for uh, for this kind of data. Um, the variability is also very important. Um, you can imagine that there's huge differences in um, control measures if you look at the technical specifications or the maintenance the level of maintenance uh, and the use in practice. We need to wrap up. Uh, Hank, can you go to your concluding yeah. Uh, slide? Yeah. So these are all interesting information about uh, risk management measures, which is very important. So in our final slide, um, what we want to do is we want to bring together different, uh, very important information about uh, RMM applications and their effectiveness and to improve guidance and implementation. Um, so what we've done, we started with a project this year, uh, Safe by Design for Nano. Um, and we are in work package uh, four. 
which is shaped by process design. And uh, what we want to do there is to develop a, a risk management measure performance prediction model and link this uh, also with the exposure model and the infrastructure of the entire tool. Um, what we also want to do, obviously, is to include safe by, uh, by material design, which will be work package, which is work package uh, three in the project. Um, so I think that's that's something that that will be uh, developed be developed uh, coming here uh, next year. We will start off with with uh, most of these um, work packages. Um, yeah, and these last two points are important things that we have to consider in terms of uh, further analysis of um, RMM. Um, effective as data um, and we also need to include much more data uh, that we really need uh, for the future yep. okay thanks very much uh, Hank right. uh, please put your questions in the chat again for the audience and Hank you can maybe answer them uh, we only have a, a short 10 minutes left for Nathan so, so Nathan sorry about that but please try to keep your presentation as short as possible because we move on after 11 so uh, uh, Nathan, the floor is yours. Nathan, are you there? Yeah. So sorry for the um, camera. I do not have any camera. Uh, my camera is not working. In fact. So uh, good morning, everybody. I would like first to thanks to Wouter and Martin for the great organization. So today we'll talk about lifecycle thinking in nanoform models assessment, and I will use a gracious case study to to develop my uh, my points. So I am Nathan Bosa, and thanks to Camila, she presents like some really great work about uh, the data template that we are building in Gracious in order to create, share, and reuse exposure data. And here I will more focus about how do we get this data experimentally and how these data are generated. So as you as you know, nanomaterial um, are rollies, rollies of nanomaterial occur during their complete life cycle, from that synthesizing, manufacturing, use, and end of life. And since of 20 years, we are uh, um, release library is growing. Now we are able to create and we'll be able to reuse this data to other perspective and to and to, for example, to create some model built on the top of it to predict the exposure. But what is, what is important when we are trying to get the data, uh, to get this release data, is to understand what parameters are driving the release. Meaning that how we can uh, predict the release when we have one nanoform, one process is involved in the, in the release. And for example, uh, when this nanomaterial is incorporated in a product, how we can predict the release if we are doing, if, if this product undergo abrasion. So, and this property, that this parameter that is driving the release can be categorized in three, three main parts. Parameter linked to the processes, that can be the energy involved, et cetera. Parameter linked to the product where the nanomaterial is in, uh, incorporated in, if it's the case, of course. And thirdly, the nanomaterial property, uh, the nanoform property, if it's the size, the dustiness, et cetera, that can be some good parameter. And why we need this parameter and to understand the mechanism of police is to establish, in fact, a hypothesis and professional criteria for grouping in order to provide some guiding principle for it, of course. As you know, we have like plenty of processes that can uh, provoke some bodies, also plenty of uh, different nanoforms and plenty of different application and product matrix that the nanomaterial are incorporated in. So it's we have plenty of possibility, and it's for that we need to define this parameter to, to perform some grouping. And these grouping are made of, based on three different big data points. That's the release rate, how much is released, the release form, but also, and also the exposure rates and population. So what can be these parameters? Parameter linked to the processes can be linked to the energy, the time, for example, the energy factor involved. You understand that, for example, if we are applying uh, mechanical stress, we are applying high, high energy during a short period of time, and oh no, sorry, abrasion. And the aging factor will be mechanical stress. If we are dealing with weathering processes that could lead to some release, we are low energy, uh, long period of time, and the aging factor are totally different. This is uh, the rain and the UV. For the nano enabled product, 
So most of the time, especially during the when we look at the release during use and that of life, we are dealing with nanoform that are incorporating in product, different type of product that can be solid matrices like paint, cement, and also some uh, liquid one and stuff like that. And so parameter linked to the product degradability will be sometimes a driving some good driving parameter that could be some uh, use for grouping. For example, you can imagine if you have one type of processes that is weathering, if you have a biodegradable polymer that contains some nanoform, we expect more release than if you have like uh, some uh, non uh, really strong and non degradable polymer that incorporate nanoform. So it is this type of parameter that we are looking for with thinking of nano animal parameter linked to the nano animal product. For the property, we are looking for, for example, doing the synthesizing of the manufacturing when we are handling nanoform. It can be some dusty net that, we, that can drive the, the release of this nanoform. It can be the shape, the solubility as well. And so far, when we are trying, to, when we are compiling the data as a general view, the parameter linked to the processes are more as the most important parameter that drives the release. And and for that, in Gracious, we have divided our work in terms of processes. We have like some work that is targeting if we want to group according to uh, the uh, mechanical stress, weathering, for example, washing of space type. We are trying to deal with, we are separating in processes. Then the parameter that drives, uh, that show the second less importance are linked to the nano enabled product. For example, the product matrix degradability, but also where the, where, we, where the nanoform uh, localization, for example, if you have a coating, coating, or this is embedded with a product. Also, the type of binding between the product and matrix and the, uh, and the nanoform. For example, in textile, when we are doing some washing, the binding time with the nanoform and the textile fiber are, is a really important parameter to, to, uh, that could be used that can be used for grouping. And also, thirdly, the nanoform property, the shape, chemistry, and size. And we have seen that nanoform property modulates the degree of release, but it's not the first one. It's not the most, in most of the cases, it's not the most influenced. There's two minutes left, uh, Nathan. Okay, I will try to go fast. For example, in this case of paint can study, we are like, if you, if you consider the, the life cycle stage of use, uh, of paint can study what type of process can undergo paint. You can go some weathering, abrasion. Also, you can think of your, your kids that is touching the, the paint, that's so smooth rubbing. So we have plenty of processes. Then if we consider of weathering, we have plenty of parameters that we could think of uh, that is, um, that, could, that could be driving the, how much is released from paint during weathering. For example, it could be it could be like the matrix from the nanoform property, the chemistry. Is it soluble or not? Is it the the, the paint uh, getting degraded by UV um, or rain? Do the paint is permeable or not? And is the nanoform applied on the surface or completely deep into the surface? also the support of the paint? So this is what I want to point is like when you assess bullies. It's we need also we need to have a really good understanding about the processes that is involved and also the product matrix, not only the nanoform property. So we need to have deep knowledge of how these products are made. So in Gracious, what we are doing, we are we are dealing with a different type of nanomaterial that we are putting in different type of products, paint, paper, plastic, and plastic film. And what is really important is we are working with industrial partners with relevant products that are actually commercialized. And so what is why is important to work with this type of product is because, in fact, we have the information from the manufacturer that we, we can go and ask them questions, uh, have, have a good partnership with them to, to, to have information about the parameter coming from the processes or the product matrix that we are not expert at. We are more expert in nanoform characterization most of the time. So, so but we need this deep knowledge in terms of product. One minute, please, uh, Nathan. Yeah, I go fast, I hope we'll be on time. So in Gracious, what we are simulating in terms of processes, we are we are looking for the use and end of life. And I will not go into details, but here is a type of diverse process that we are simulating from food contact, abrasion for end of life, landfilling, incineration, weathering as well, and a small dermal contact with small scrubbing. For example, in the paint, we have seen a uh, um, bad effect of the paint that contain lead uh, 
lead um, metals before and with uh, Saturnism, uh, Saturnism disease. And so we are looking for this type of um, um, dermal contact sample in the paint. We are looking for the rate, form, and exposure and wood population. And shortly, how, we, how do we, what looks like experiment? In fact, what we are simulating experimentally these processes and we are adapting some, um, how to say, some, pro, some, uh, some method that has been developed to, by the industrial of the sector. Some protocol that have been, I mean, to, to, develop, to develop as a producer to develop uh, resistance. For example, in the, in the simulating on contact, we are, we are, this process, we use a crop meter, and this, this has been validated by the Consumer Product Safety Coalition to, to really extrapolate this data that we are getting from this um, experiment to a real life event. For landfilling, it's a bit more difficult because we need to extrapolate 30 years. In uh, here, we are using a protocol that takes uh, one day, basically. So we, we are applying worst case scenario, and it's difficult to extrapolate. But in that case, we are more comparing the results. And for weathering, we are using climatic chamber that simulates cycle of UV and rain, for example. And we are we use uh, UV energy as a way to compare the, that, the experiment and to extrapolate to a life event. And we are collecting the runoff to detect how much is released, what is the force. And this can, can you please can wrap up it. now, Nathan? Yeah. And thanks for your attention. I would ah. like to thank you, everybody, uh, all the partners involved and the organization. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Nathan. And, and, and thank to all the presenters. Uh, thank you all. I, I suppose the chat will remain open. So, so, so please put your uh, questions in the chat. Uh, and I hand over to, to Martin now. Thank you. Thank you, Wouter, and the team from TNO, and as well the team from Leitat, uh, for giving us uh, these insights into many things that they do. And I guess we have to follow this up in more detail in dedicated sessions uh, on exposure assessment, exposure determination, um, cross-linking or kind of extrapolating from other chemical exposure scenarios. I mean, there is a whole lot of things to be done, and I guess work group C is going to be in touch with working group A, that we can also kind of um, outreach this to the audience, that we can get access to this to the application of these tools. So I give you again um, a couple of minutes for moving your bones and getting some fresh air into the head um, while I'm uploading the next presentations. And we are now looking forward to get into data, the data fairness, metadata discussion um, in a bit. Klaus Wenzen is already here, the new chair, and uh, we continue in two more minutes. Hi, Martin, can you hear me? Hello, Klaus. This is uh, the next session chair is Klaus uh, Svensson from the UK CEH, and I'm very happy that we can welcome you here today. I heard your voice already. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, and we're going to look now into data fairness, data um, met metadata. Um, the floor is yours. I would also trust like to point your attention to the top 
I will in a, in a bit uh, display um, our dashboard, uh, which links you to several further links uh, that are going to be uh, necessary for the next couple of sessions. So in a bit, there will be this uh, call for action button available again, which you can directly go to the Nano Commons powered uh, dashboard um, to have easy uh, access to information and links. Klaus, please start with your session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I've been asked to chair this session and, and lead in with giving an experience from Nanophase of how it was to go fair before the systems were really ready for it. Um, so Nanophase was a, how do I move the slides on, Martin? There we go. Okay. Um, so Nanophase was a fate-based um, project. It was one of the first to really deal with the fate of, of materials in terms of how they were changed going through the manufacturing process that you can see over here um, in the, in the left-hand side. And having to track things in time and across different processes, we had to look at what transformations happened in waste. We had to look at things that happened in time across different media and really the databases that were there weren't geared for that so we had to look around at different options for how we would record our data so we could share it later we obviously knew knew we had to make it findable and available but there was nowhere that could really house it at that stage uh, next slide please martin if you can Oh, can I, I can do it here, got it. Um, so if we were looking in our waste management, instead of having a, a single form of nano that we did something to, and then we looked at some results, we actually had a single form of nano copper oxide that we put in a sewage works, simulated sewage works, and then looked at the change of it over time. So you can see the times go very fast, but that meant we had to be able to track different situations within our data sets as we went along. Um, it also had to be able to house model setups and tracking all the parameters that would go on within these model experiments. So some of those data would look like this, where you'd have um, earthworm uptakes of, of ions versus particles. Um, here you had an, a, a particle exposure, and you could see that uh, we had Exposure, con uh, con exposure over 28 days and then clean soils over 28 days. So the exposure situation was different for the organisms that were in there. And we then had to track what happened to forms over time. It wasn't just put it in, this was the form, this was the toxicity, uh, the toxicity output at the end of the experiment. Um, that meant we had to look into people that had done mesocosm experiments before that we'd worked with, so people at Serenade and people at Saint, uh, who had this concept of the instance. So uh, you buy a nanoparticle, you have it from the manufacturer, it has a, had a set of properties, you then characterize it when it's arrived, and the system that you're going to keep it in, which was a, make it into a water, then put it into the suspensions for the experiment which is different chemistry so we'd have to characterize it again because the nanomaterials would have changed and then look at an exposure experiment where we would have to track it in time and look at different parameters over time so these instances became really important the way we had to to do that was create an instance where we measure everything we can. But then the next instance, we have a medium which has properties that needs recording. So that's part of the metadata. We then have to cover everything we can about the material now, which has more parameters on it than it did before. Uh, and then the next step is, you know, the next time point or another, another media part, the, maybe the sediment or the organism. And again, you'd have to characterize the medium and the material within that stage. So for bigger experiments, that obviously become more complex. Uh, we end up with big schemes like this, which I'm sure Tassos has explained to some of you previously or, or will uh, at some point later when you need to use the data in trees. The thing we had to manage to make, make connect was that obviously this NICC, which is the 
um, uh, the, the database built in America was built based on all the old existing ontologies. So there was as much comparability between the two, the European eNanomapa system and the NIC from Saint uh, in America. We put all the nanophase, the Saint data, the Serenade data, and some of the IVM data in through the in through the NIC, which had the right structure, which then through Biomax and Nanomile was connected to other data within Nanocommons, which is then being fed into the Nanocommons knowledge portal, um, which we'll hear about later. The way we were going to then make it findable and accessible was is via the nanophase clickable framework which you can find on the nanophase website you basically click through find find the exposure assessment framework when you get there you click on the knowledge base data at the bottom uh, which then takes you on to a page that is on tassos created um, click again on the on the data side in there and you'll get to the piece about how we dealt with metadata, ontology, terminology, data capture template. I'd like to go on to this bit here uh, at the bottom, which, which if you scroll down, it looked like this. There's a, both a visual graphical manual to how we did it and a text-based manual. Um, this was created at a workshop in, in France where we had all the people from Serenade, uh, Nanoface and, and, and Saint there to try and put it together, it got put together by Christine Hendren um, in a company uh, called Helium. The main thing is that it takes time, it takes planning. You really have to have the resources in place. It doesn't take long to work out what you need to do, probably half an hour uh, to two hours when you sit down with the right person. In our case, that was Tassos. But then the time starts to build in terms of, once you have to customize the Excel templates to work with the actual experiments, you're, you're looking at a day's work. But when you're trying to fill it out, you're looking at somebody who knows their experiment spending a good week trying to curate their data into the template and making sure it's right before it then gets checked by the curator and uploaded. So these time frames it really does need to be planned into, into projects uh, if, you, if you really want to make your data fair, uh, as Thomas and and I'm going to talk about later. So I think that's all I want to say as an intro. I think we'll take questions later and just hand straight over to Thomas. Uh, otherwise, we'll just end up answering the things he's going to talk about. Thank you very much. Um, so Thomas, when you're ready. Can you hear me, sir? I can hear you, yeah. You cannot. I can. <laughs> I can, yes, good, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to continue on your nice presentation. I think that was a really nice introduction of why metadata is important and, and, and why we have to work on that. And also the time and the people have to be involved uh, or have to be involved in that. Um, therefore, I will just continue with what, what Klaus just um, said from my point of view, which is called or we call now the the uh, data shepherd point of view and what that exactly means uh, you will also hopefully see at the end um, there is a short survey which i would like just like as in the previous talks create a, um, a word map um, you can reach that on the top and uh, on the bottom above um, uh, no i think you see my point as yeah. well you click out on the on the bar on the right hand side click on the next slide out there yeah no but just fill it in i i started with ninchi to to just have it as a as a starting point what that is you also will see in a second um what we want to do is to to share data that that is what what the fair principles or the the open science or open data initiative from uh, from the EU and so on, that really this concept of, of being able to reuse data more often, uh, not just for the, the purpose they were actually created for. And for that, there are coming a lot of more requirements on that. And this is especially metadata and, uh, because the metadata will make data complete or at least 
partly uh, more complete, which is probably not, not the concept, but um, but at least more usable. Yeah, and and for that you really have to think of what what really do you have to give to, um, or yeah give additionally to to the to the numbers that that others can can uh, understand that this is already I think four years old yeah from a paper. Um, where they looked at all these concepts of completeness, what does that really mean? And I think completeness is really content specific, yeah, because data might be complete for, for using in a specific content context, but it might be just unusable in others. And th that is exactly the question. How can we make it as complete as possible, which means as many applications of the data are possible? Um, then this also relates to, to data quality clearly, yeah, because in principle there is sure you are doing the experiment and and you you try to do the high get the high highest quality out there, but in principle if you then not report your data accordingly to to standards, then uh, the best experimental quality is is not sufficient because people will not be able to read. Therefore, there is also a data a, a data management quality you have to, to agree. On. Yeah, what what are the standards you want your your, your data to to be shown? Um, this led to these fair principles, and I won't don't go into into the the details of all that because Omar will do that later. The main point which I want to highlight light is this red um, arrow down there because that is the main mentioning of metadata yeah and um, you have to see that the, the fairness principles are guidelines but they are not telling you what to do uh, they, they tell you you should uh, do your your data according to community standards but we have to define that and, and I think Klaus just showed a very nice example how these standards can be and have to be defined yeah it's it's work um, these were the, the original one, as I said, I will not go into these, but, but we also thought that because there is no really guidelines on, on the scientific side or the community side, what does it really mean that, that these are according to, to standards or how do you create these metadata standards? We said uh, we should look into that a little bit more detailed and, and create these scientific uh, fair principles which are really more guidelines on what the community is needing to do. And this is um, just these links or the, the examples I have on here, but, but in principle, that is what I will talk about in the next couple of minutes. Now going to these Ninchi, and I just want to bring a little bit of a different uh, point of view on that. Most people think about metadata from their, their standpoint of, of um, data curation and, and bringing their data into, into the topic. But in principle, um, yes, sure, this, and, and see what you want to, to, to provide to your data. But I want to start with a little bit <laughs> different focus. We had this initiative that we wanted to create an identifier for an article and a little bit more than just, okay, it's a titanium dioxide site, but it really has some kind of information on top of that, um, that you can distinguish between, for example, one nanoform in a regulatory um, application and another. Yeah, and, and for doing that, we started a group of people starting to discuss all these points and people came up with ideas what is needed to really identify or identify a nanoparticle um, di differentiated from a nano, um, nano, other nanoparticle and that should be all in this ninchi in this uh, inchi for now uh, inchi if you don't know the, the inchi inchi is in principle an identifier a chemical identifier for small molecules um, mainly organic molecules, but we, we said it has a nice concept which can be extended to one as well. Therefore, we, we decided to use the Ninchi or the Inchi and then extend it. But here are just these points, what people think is all needed for, for, for uh, really characterizing a, a nanoparticle. Yeah? And there are clearly chemical structures, overall composition, 
composition, core composition, and so on, nanoparticles, charge, charge density, roughness. And when I saw this list, uh, ligand identity around this, when I saw this list, then I was just thinking, are people really reporting that as metadata for the, their 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 experiments? Yeah, if they think this has to be even part of an identifier, then these all these information should be at one point of time be the um, am I out of time or somebody <laughs> <laughs> changed my slide. Something happened to who's presenter. We're seeing your slide. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, just to say, okay, in principle, all these things would have to be be, be presented as 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 metadata to an experiment, whatever experiment you are doing, because people think that this is important to identify. A yeah, and, and I'm agreeing that this is much too much, and therefore we decided on, on a couple of case studies for different application areas to boil that down, that we come to an identifier, yeah, and a useful identifier which at least divides nanoparticles into groups of nanoparticles, which can then be more specific and more specific by, by other metadata. Yeah, and this is what we said, okay, chemical composition, size, shape, these kind of things are clear. They should, they are really also defined in a regulatory um, setting as differentiating different nanoforms. Therefore, we said this is okay, nice to have the surface composition, density, sur uh, structural defects, something like that. And then there are clearly things which are important, but which are beyond the scope of an identifier and perhaps in most cases even beyond the scope of a metadata which you assign to a data set because we most often don't know it. You know? Do we know all the magnetic properties? Probably not. Do we know the exact uh, oxidation state? Yeah, but if you have it, sure, this is important metadata, but if you don't have it, um, you can just not report it and if that is part of an identifier, you cannot say, okay, is it not known? Is it just not defined or whatever? And therefore, I'm clearly saying, okay, this is beyond the, the Inchi concept. But also think about that people really decided or said that this is important to identify or to, to, to separate nanoparticles and therefore also results from the experiment. Okay, to get all this data, yeah, we uh, just showed, and I think we had a couple of other talks where we clearly showed why why this metadata is so important, and the coverage of, of that is important. Therefore, I'm now switching more to how do we get to this this data uh, uh, correlated metadata, yeah, and and this is something which I think uh, the nano phase is a nice example because uh, in principle. All these and, and Klaus said yes because there was not we were not at that point at the stage where this is, was all possible. But new projects don't have this excuse anymore. Yeah, there there are things, but it has to be directly integrated in the pro uh, project and done more or less from the day one. Yeah, and and all the partners have to be in principle uh, involved. If you just put that onto the the task of the data manager, your designated Meta, uh, data manager in the project, then this will not work. Yeah, it will just not work. You need to go back to the the data creators, then then the the analysts, and so on, and and then also have some some data creators involved, which check what you put in and so on. And this is time consuming. Yeah, Klaus talked about uh, seven days for for one data set. Yeah, this is this is a huge amount of effort, but I think it's worth to do this effort. Um, here, just another uh, view of, of this. <clears throat> yeah, people are involved in many, many of these tasks for, for getting really the data collected and then uploaded. And we have here this new rule as a, a shepherd who is really there to bring these people together and, and try to, to organize all these processes and, and get people talk to each other, have feedback loops that when, when, when the curator doesn't find or thinks that a specific meta, uh, data point is missing, that they then 
try to, to get that from the data creators uh, uh, or the analysts. Um, <clears throat> again, here just this instance map, I think we had that already, therefore I can jump over that, <clears throat> just to say, okay, most of the time we still organize that in, in Excel sheets. Um, that's definitely a, a way to go because people are also used to, to Excel sheets, but I also want to use some time to, to think about where can we go further. Now yeah, for the nanoinformatics, there are similar things than what we just saw for FATE. Yeah, that, that there are specific already agreed um, uh, templates. Yeah, the MODA is for, for simulation of, for example, membranes and so on, uh, interaction with nanoparticles with membranes or uh, proteins with, uh, with nanoparticles and so on. And then for the QSAR type of modeling, we have these QMRFs, uh, which are really just some way to report that. But what you see here is that most of these things are very much free text. Yeah, they are just connecting things together and, and people just write in there, which makes it very hard to, to then extract that. Yeah, the material here is somewhere in the user case. Yeah, you have there the material sets. Um, therefore, if you want to go further, there was this idea which we had in, in Ace Nano of a questionnaire yeah, where, where these things are really more organized in a, in, a, in, a, yeah, in a structured way that the, the size distribution and so on are really an, 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 a kind of defined way to report that, for example, report also then on the experimental setup, the machinery we're using and so on. And this is what we had here, yeah, that you really have a web interface where all these things are um, um, put in you can then annotate that and so on and, and get this structure and then have also ways to, to communicate or to, to extract this data easier and then compare it with other data sets in the, in the data warehouses. You can then also, or again, back to the workflow, how you get this in. It's also clear that, that we want that, that because it is so much uh, work, we also have to support that technically, and, and there are ways to get a lot of metadata from, from example, the, your, your, out, uh, your, your standard output files from the instruments and so on, and, and try to collect that also in a more automatic way and not have you all type in or copy paste it from other files. Um, finally, why do we do that? Yeah, or I, I think I already touched that point. Yeah, the idea is really that we have these different projects, all these produce data, and we want to find, in principle, all the data from all these projects, and therefore uh, the idea of, of having linked metadata or metadata based uh, linkage between the data warehouses and then have one common search interface where all these things can go in and, and you just type that. Um, Okay, I'm running out of time, or <laughs> at least people are reminding me that I might run out of time. Uh, just to let you know that, that we hope that at one point of time, we have these different warehouses which are really optimized, and the metadata which is covered there is optimized for very specific specific areas like first cam characterization or hazard or fade or whatever. Um, but then you have these overlap, uh, laying infrastructure which then really combines these different data sets and in that way brings you an overall view on, on a specific nanoparticle. Good. Um, this all, and I already mentioned, that has to be uh, supported by ontologies to make these links between these data warehouses, but there is another short presentation uh, later where we will go into these um, into, into ontologies a little bit more. Important is that these ontologies also help to, to, to get the people understand each other because creators and data managers and customers might have very different uh, um, understanding of, very, of one specific um, term. And this is just instance here as an example. I often use uh, 
um, endpoint as an example because they really mean different things and these ontologies also help us to to understand what the other person thinks about a specific term and if we are not agreeing on this terminology then we might have to do something else but but that's later as well Finally, uh, this slide is a summary. Um, when is metadata complete? Uh, the question is, can it be complete? Yeah, because it uh, started with, you have all these different applications and different applications need um, different metadata. And it's also such a huge effort to, to support all that. Yeah, but in principle, we can start with standards like, for example, the one defined by Nanophase. Um, we should improve them over time yeah, because the experiments become better, but we also see more and more applications of this data. And therefore, we should think about do we need to capture more metadata in the future? Um, and we want to really support that with, with new technology. Yeah? And as I, uh, this, again, this, this table here from this paper, I think it's very important that you understand that this is really an effort all of us have to do, and therefore just um, this advertisement for the um, nano safe uh, for the working F. At the moment, it's really mainly um, data managers in there um, and ontology developers, but I think it, it becomes more and more important that also the cur creators, the analysts, the curators are coming in, and and we have some shepherds, and we want to look for more shepherds who then take care of organizing that with these different groups. That's it. Um, if I have a couple of minutes, and I will just try to share my screen quickly. Um, I can share my screen. screen sharing, because then we can see if somebody filled something in. No, not yet, <laughs> but I keep that open. I hope that it works, but if you have some metadata which I missed, which you think is so important that you want to, to mention that, please go in, fill there some metadata fields. You can also start with size and something like that. But just as if if I missed something, if you have a very specific field you want to put something in, I would be happy to see uh, more metadata fields which you see as missing in most of the of the data sets yeah if you if you just experience that you would always like to see something specifically and you never found it in, in publications or in, in data entries and databases just fill that in into this meti uh, uh survey thank you excellent thank you very much thomas thank you for keeping to time uh there are no questions in the chat so far, but I'm sure they'll turn up as soon as the master starts speaking. So I'll let you field them, field them in text. Um, I think that <clears throat> the experience we had from from Nanophase is you need, you really do need to think about this stuff, as you say, up ahead of the project. You know, you, otherwise you'll run out of tassos, um, which which we luckily didn't do but i would have liked to not abuse tassos as much as we did um he's he's one of the people that whenever we meet him everybody feels like they need to buy him a beer because it it was too hard work in nanophase um so i would really suggest to people to read through the manual or or talk uh to people like thomas and tassos and our plan it in from the start don't 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 try and do it as you move along it has to be planned in okay um i think if a mars slides are ready martin we'll we'll keep the time and then we'll see what time there is for a bit of discussion at the end thank you very much i saw you show your camera earlier mar i don't know whether you just want to check that the sound is all right yes i'm here thank you do you hear me yeah, perfectly. Thank you. All Great. yours. Yeah. Welcome all uh, to the Nano Safety Cluster Education Day. Uh, in this session, I will be talking about, uh, first, my name is Amar Amar. I am a PhD student at the Department of Bioinformatics at Maastricht University, the Netherlands. In this session, I will be talking about uh, how to implement uh, scient the scientific FAIR principles uh, in your work or my work. And uh, FAIR is an acronym for four words, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, 
and uh, this is uh, guiding these are guiding principle that were uh, defined uh, and introduced so uh, the scientific research output can be used can be reused and can be uh, 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 maximally benefited of so why do we need fair uh, in scientific research data sharing and reuse are beneficial for time efficiency and increased productivity uh, so instead of keep keeping repeating uh, the same experiments in different institutions uh, and reinventing the wheel, we can, if we shared our data in a fair way, we can reuse this data, we can uh, embed it uh, or integrate it with an, another system through interoperable uh, software and so on. But for now, the data reuse remains difficult, and that's due to the lack of infrastructure, standards, and policies that should be adopted uh, w widely around the globe so we can make benefit of, of uh, this data and reuse it. And the FAIR principles aims to provide guidance uh, to increase the data discovery and reuse. Since those principles are more like verbally defined, they're not te technically defined, uh, the fairness of a data set, uh, even though the fairness of a data set can be assessed using something called maturity indicators, which, uh, which I will be talking about in a, in a moment. Uh, so these are the four uh, uh, fair principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And each one of, if, of them, there is uh, more sub sub principles. In total, fifteen principles. So, in findability, we focus on uh, identifying your work, uh, uh, providing metadata, and indexing the data and repositories for accessibility. It's about using standardized protocols like HTTP protocols uh, uh, and, and also uh, authentication when necessary and making sure the data is always there. Interoper interoperability, that means the ability of integrate data sets from different resources. And that uh, for, to do that, we should use like a shared language. It's called controlled vocabularies uh, and make sure these uh, vocabularies are also fair. And uh, so we can link the data uh, through their metadata. Reusability uh, is about more defining a license for using your, your, uh, for your uh, data set. So to define how others can use it, the provenance, who made this data and when it was published and by whom, and also adopting the community standards for each one of those um, uh, protocols. So how to be fair in your work? There is several points I would, I would like to go into, and each one of those uh, points uh, should be adopted by researchers when they start designing an experiment or producing a data set, either from a computational approach or experimental uh, uh, practice approach. The first thing is once you have a data set, you have to put it online. So it's more advisable to put this data in, in a specialized uh, research repository that makes sure this data is, um, uh, uh, is exposed in, in a fair way to the world uh, while putting it on a personal website or, or a website that doesn't follow the standards makes it very hard to reach by other researchers and, and people around the world. So research repositories, it's like um, a database of data sets and they provide several uh, policies, several policies um, and they also define clear, uh, clear, uh, uh, clear terms for use and also they, sh they also uh, the research data repository provides open, restricted or closed access to the data depending on their policies. Uh, the usage license is also provided by the repository and also the, the repositories use persistent identifiers uh, to make your data persistent, unique and citable, which is very important, uh, as important as in your journal uh, articles when you want to cite other people's work. Also for your data sets, when you use it, it should be identifiable, uniquely identified uh, so you can cite it. and. Uh, also, the research data repositories are usually certified or supports a, a repository standard. This is about data repository, which is you deposit your data sets in. But the data repository itself, it should be assessed 
for its fairness and for its compliance with all the criteria uh, of the fair principles and that's where we when we have uh, data registries so a data registry it's provide information about repositories not about the data sets but about the repository itself or the database itself for permanent storage and access of the data sets in it uh, so researchers funding bodies and publish and publishers uh, can access and make use of this data and i will give an example here it's one of the data registries called re3data.org uh, it contains numerous data sets in many different uh, disciplines of sciences and uh, this registry when you submit your uh, uh, repository to this registry it's get being reviewed and assessed for similar criteria like uh, the information that it provides the accessibility uh, is it open or restricted or closed the licenses they provide is it open source or how can it be reused which kind of persistent identifiers it um, it provides uh, the certificates and standards and policies and once once your uh, data repository or database is being uh, uh, reviewed or accredited or accepted uh, you can also generate for your data repository a badge like this this is an example for the eNanoMapper database which uh, uh, you can see this is the badge for uh, for this entry in the re3 data repository there is a permanent identifier for this uh, repository and here you can see the criteria that are fulfilled by by this repository and so we see how data registries can be used to assess and to provide it's it's a it's a good way when you want to put your data set in a certain repository is to go to such registries and search for the repositories that fulfill the, uh, the, the criteria that you prefer for your data. So it's a simple uh, decision tree when you have your data first you ask the question, what type of data do you have? Is it a data set? Then you, de you deposit that in a data repository. Or, and if it's a database, you're making a database or repository, which is a collection of other data sets, then you have to register that in a data registry. Uh, this is for the first point I want to talk about, about data repositories and registries. The second point is metadata and controlled vocabularies. And high quality metadata improves data discovery because if you put your data sets like an Excel sheet or small access file uh, on the internet without any information about it, it will be hard to be reused. It will be hard to be interpreted and, uh, and, and uh, being incorporated in other people's research. So it's very important to provide metadata about your work uh, and controlled vocabularies it's like a set of terms that uh, or fields or properties that can uniquely uh, uh, identify your data and which increase the chance to be discovered uh, by uh, user searches over the web and metadata schemas it's a sort of controlled vocabulary but for the web uh, made for the web so when you mark your data set with with a metadata schema you can make your data findable to the world one of the widely adopted schemas, it's uh, schema.org, uh, and this is adopted by Google and the major search engines. It has an extension for the life sciences domain called bioschemas.org, and uh, uh, you annotate your, the page where you upload your data set with this schema uh, on your personal website or institute website, which makes it much easier to be picked up by the Google data set search and also to uh, extract this metadata from it automatically and, and uh, increase uh, or boost the discovery of your data set. The third thing we will talk about is permanent identifiers. So uh, usually you, people use a link to their data set uh, to the page where they put it and this uh, it's important to notice that web links can break websites are are not uh, guaranteed to be online for 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 long terms and the tracking down the data based on a general description can be challenging so sometimes if you if you wrote uh, in natural language a query in google it's very hard to uh, uh, to get the data set that you're really targeting so you need something that is more uniquely identified this data and you can access it uh, permanently and and directly and the solution for that is permanent identifiers 
And there is several uh, kinds of identifiers implemented. One of them is DOI, and I think all of you recognize that this is coming from is the same identifier used by journal art articles, where your publications and articles are given a DOI identifier. And, and, and this is a permanent identifier that guarantees every time you click on the URL of that article, it will take you to the uh, uh, publication uh, website or, or the material itself. The same for data sets, also they can be given a, a DOI identifier. The structure here, there's an example of the structure of the identifier it composed, it's a URL, so it's accessible through any web browser. Uh, through the HTTP protocol. It's composed of three sections. The first part is the DOI directory. The second part is the prefix and mostly related to the uh, uh, publishing uh, side. And the suffix is about the, 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 uh, uh, the targeted or the, the data set or the article that is being identified. On the other hand, ORCID is uh, is a different kind of identifiers. I will I will come to that in a moment. And the benefits of having uh, this permanent identifier is keeping track of the data and making sure this data does not get lost or identified. For example, having uh, two data sets with similar titles or uh, published by the same author, but with, with certain um, uh, enhancements or modifications. So having a unique identifier is makes sure that this data is not uh, uh, misidentified and it has permanent access to this material. And also it's easier to cite and track the impact of the data sets uh, the same way that journal articles are. So you want, if you want to incorporate other people's data sets in your research, you also you need these uh, identifiers to cite their work and keep track on the impact that of your, of your own data sets. So the other kind of data of identifiers is called ORCID ID, and this is for the researcher side. So we're not talking about identifying the article and 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 uh, the data set, but here we are talking about identifying the researcher himself or herself. So this is also a URL based identifier. It's global. It's unique to every researcher. Uh, anybody can sign up for this uh, for this identifier ORCID ID, and it has been used to link the researchers to several things like universities and institutions, funding agencies, other kinds of identifiers like the researcher ID and the pub loans, and also uh, uh, for for the networks for researchers like ResearchGate and Mendeley. Uh, and other repositories like Figshare and Zenodo. So with this unique ORCID identifier, you can be linked through all your uh, publication journals for your uh, institution and uh, other networks, and which is, makes it easy to track uh, the impact of the researcher, his scientific output, uh, and, and all the, the achievements he, uh, he or, or she does in their life career. Uh, so for permanent identifiers, those are the two important things that are recommended to, to keep in mind and use as much as possible your own identifier as a researcher and uh, for each data set, give it a permanent identifier. And usually when you choose a repository to deposit your data sets, these repositories take care of giving permanent identifiers. 10 minutes left, Amar. Yes. Yeah, for the, for the fourth point I want to talk about, it's data formats. So when you uh, having uh, your output, uh, data output in a well-structured and well-organized way, uh, this is, makes it uh, to be easy, much easier to be reused. And it makes it inter interoperable. That means uh, softwares can parse this data and, and integrate it with other data sets coming from other places. And uh, as many of you know, in the life sciences domain, researchers capture their data in spreadsheets, spreadsheets and also spreadsheets can be, uh, there is uh, several guidelines to how to make your spreadsheets fair. I will give some examples. Um, so for example, it's important to have a persistent uh, way of encoding empty values. And it's uh, recommended to use a value for that, like an NA, which will be recognized by programming languages like R or a NAN for non-available, but not to use empty, empty uh, cells in Excel. Another example also, also, it's important to keep each value in your data set in a separate column and not use columns with combined 
combined values like here core size and surface charge in one column and and the data is uh, separated by a comma but you should put every value in its own column a third column a third uh, best practices for spreadsheets is to use consistent uh, date format and it's better to use one uh, like uh, widely used formats like uh, this one for the year as four digits the month as two digits and the day as two digits and not using different um, formats or uh, unknown formats that would be hard to be parsed by uh, pro uh, softwares Another example is when you want to annotate your data with a certain feature like increase or decrease, for example, differentially expressed genes or uh, physiochemical properties, avoid uh, doing uh, coloring or, or, or putting data in a specific place on the sheet to indicate certain meaning, but always encode all the, the properties in the same cell. So here, instead of coloring with green for increase and red for decrease, we use a plus or, si or, or minus signs. And these are practices should be adopted by researchers when they produce their data as spreadsheets. Also, we, uh, uh, not, it's not enough also to put your data in a table, but you have to provide the metadata to describe that uh, tabular format. And this is called data dictionary. And data dictionary, it helps documenting your model. So uh, for example, you have to, in this data dictionary, you list all the columns names used in the data spreadsheet, as we see here. In the, in the figure and you provide a description for each one of the, the purpose of these columns, the data type they provide, is it an integer, a date, a floating point value, or just a string. And also you have to give an indication of the units of measurements because when people want to integrate this data with other data sets, if you do not give uh, specific units to your numbers, it will be hard to incorporate it in, in a future research. And the fourth point is to describe the measures that have been taken to ensure the correctness uh, and the consistency of data, like the platform uh, where the experiment has been conducted, how many repeats, and so on. Licensing is the fifth point in this uh, about uh, making data fair and data citation. So you should give your data license where uh, the license describes the conditions under which your data so or software is reusable. So, uh, and if you are interested in open licenses, you can check the creativecommons.org website where it provides uh, several licenses and you can choose what suits your data set. And also uh, state how to cite your data. So uh, always provide information about the author, the creator, the date of publication, and the, the organization where the data set was produced, plus the unique identifier. Uh, also, it's important to notice that long-term data stewardship is an important factor for keeping data open and accessible for longer term. The sixth point we come to is as we saw before, fair principles are uh, are are verbal uh, are verbally addressed. They do not have any technical implementation uh, or technical requirements, and uh, data reusability in the life sciences domain is hard to quantify. The fair assessment usually is mostly done manually, so you submit your data set to a certain uh, uh, service or, or third party that does this assessment. It happens manually, which makes it uh, slow and less objective. And we lack also the means of comparing fairness uh, of the life sciences data in a visual, easy to read manner. And that's why indi maturity indicators came to the, to the picture as a, a way of uh, assessing the fairness of a data set in, in, in a programmatically implemented, um, implemented way, uh, either automatic or semi-automatic as much as possible. And recently, uh, a group I have done with several colleagues uh, at Maastricht University is about creating uh, that, uh, creating a workflow, uh, uh, a semi-automated one for fair maturity indicators in the life sciences. So it's uh, it's a Jupyter notebook. It's a workflow implemented through Jupyter notebooks in Python programming language uh, that can assess the the fairness of a data repository available on the internet. That, can, that means it can be accessed through the URL uh, uh, and, and following the, all, all the, the, the sub principles of the, of the FAIR principles. Here there is a GitHub link uh, to, to see the output of that uh, uh, research. And here is the DOI and the title of the article published in Nanomaterials. Oh, and no, this, 
Yes. In this research, we took five, uh, uh, six uh, data sets or databases on the internet with use cases like searching for titanium dioxide uh, toxicity in e nanomapper or other three uh, nanomaterials related databases. And then uh, we implemented this uh, easy to read uh, balloon uh, 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 plot to see for each one of the fair maturity indicators how well it performed or how well, uh, how much is it fair. So the size of the shape indicates the level, the score of fairness, the color is the, for the four principle, the principles and the shape if it's automatic, manual or not assist. And we can see here that the Kimball database for chemicals achieved the highest, uh, relatively the highest fairness level, while, while uh, gene expression omnibus and nanocommons achieved a relatively low fairness. So the output of the research uh, also provided a way of uh, visualizing uh, fair maturity, fair assessment through maturity indicators. Our current work is uh, about developing new maturity indicators. Uh, since we are more, uh, I am more um, specialized in working with uh, nano safety data and nano QSAR applications. So we want to develop new maturity indicators for uh, these applications, especially for the reusability and interoperability principles. Uh, so we will, uh, I am developing a maturity indicator about standardized formats like IOM, GRC and ISATAP and minimal reporting standards uh, that should be met in the assist data sets. Also after reviewing 15 nano QSAR article reviews, we saw several uh, observations that could be implemented as maturity indicators, like having at least three descriptors uh, uh, to be used in a QSAR study and uh, uh, making sure that the units are always reported so the data set can be reused for QSAR applications and also uh, frequent physiochemical features uh, were used also to, to, to make sure these uh, physiochemical uh, descriptors are always uh, present in the data sets uh, for reusability. So, in conclusion, uh, we see that implementing fair principles in our daily work is crucial to enable data discovery and reusability. We saw that um, making our data set software and workflows fair is as important as our articles and publications. Uh, there is many options as we saw. There is many tools, standards, websites. Uh, so pick up what benefits you the most. There is no right and wrong here. Just uh, try to make sure to implement those uh, those uh, main principles. And fairness, as we saw, can be measured. And we developed a semi-automated workflow to assess the fairness. And we applied it to six life sciences resources using maturity indicators. And such a workflow could help the developers of the databases to improve their fairness. And uh, these workflows can be easily extended uh, because uh, Jupyter Notebooks are easily can be extended to fit your own uh, resource that you want to assess its fairness. I would like to acknowledge uh, my my colleagues and co-authors of the uh, of the project and the published article and the RISCO Nano Solvate Government for Nano and Nano Safety Clusters uh, EU projects. And thank you for listening. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, thank you very, you very much, much, Omar. Yeah, thank you. I'm hoping, hoping everybody's clapping, clapping away in their virtual world. Yeah. This was really good. It was nice to see how to do it. Um, yeah. It, it's easy to talk about that we all should do it, but it's nice to see what the actual tools are. And, and you'll see that in the chat as well, that everybody finds it really useful. So thank you very much. Yeah, very good. Um, we have one minute for a quick question, but I can't find one that's sitting there. They're mostly complimentary to you for a very good presentation. So um, I think uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to thank the speakers that we've had here, Thomas and Amar. It's really good to see that it has moved on a, a lot from when we started Nanophase and you can plan this in now. I think I would encourage people to go and, and look in the dashboard for the active links that are there and feedback to, to Thomas and others on the exercises that are sat in the dashboard. Um, and then I'll hand back to you, Martin. Yeah. Be one final question still to be answered by Amar. We just put it on the um,
Okay, Omar, do you do you want to respond to this? That's on the screen. Actually, you're referring to this question also throughout your talk shortly. Yes, actually, anyone can place this data on a repository. Uh, most likely, it will be go, go through a, a review process uh, to check for 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 certain uh, like criteria. But this, yes, this is this is possible. Just go to re3data.org and pick up the repository from your field or discipline and submit your data there. Usually they have a link on their website for data submission and the guidelines to uh, to make your data uh, uh, comply with, with their criteria. Yes. Maybe you can also comment a little bit on how can we support people in doing that? Um, Actually, we can provide materials like links to to, to repositories and, and services that provide that, yes. Well, thanks a lot, Klaus. Thank thanks a lot, Thomas. Thanks a lot, Amar, for this insight into data. This is our data workshop, Getting Data Fair. This is, I guess, one of the most important things in this era that we are now, that our data is are not just getting into papers. This is always nice, but we need complete data sets with complete metadata sets that people can also reuse this data. There has lots of has been a lot uh, a big investment into data by the European Commission uh, throughout the past two decades, and we need to get this data into repositories that we can much we can get much more out of them. And people prediction using prediction and developing uh, prediction software can 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 work on these. Um, we have a couple of minutes uh, break, uh, three minutes on my watch, um, to continue then with um, some e tools. And we are now getting further from the data to the tools that uh, can use such data of other people and reuse and get a better impact even out of that such data. In the next uh, session number four. So we'll quickly upload the slides uh, of the presenters. Many of them are going to showcase some of the tools. So getting us really insight into by clicking into the tools on how they operate the systems. Get some fresh air into the head and make ourselves ready for the last um, morning session before the General Assembly, which is a working lunch. Ethel Lynch from the University of Birmingham for running the next session, um, the session on e-tools along the data life cycle. And Isolt is going to uh, introduce us to the topic actually 
um, highlighting what the data life cycle is from the generation, processing, evaluation, prediction, until the curation and eventual reuse of the data. And then we're gonna look uh, into a couple of tools that are yeah, using such data. So Isolt, please um, start. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay, the only challenge I have is that I'm not seeing the thing to move my slides along. Well, this should be at uh, the bottom, on the right the side. Bottom. Yeah, no, I'm not uh, seeing it for whatever reason. you can also use your um, cursor usually from your keyboard. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, so great to have you all here. Um, now we're going to just pick up um, and follow on from the, the wonderful introductory session, session three, um, for this overall topic of eTools along the data life cycle. So I'm going to spend just a very brief time to introduce you to what we mean by the data life cycle. Um, and I'm going to just go through each of the steps. And I should also thank Tassus for putting this set of slides together as well, um, which I've now tweaked slightly. So the planning stage, so, so NanoCommons is really promoting the idea that your data management process needs to start at the very beginning of your data life cycle so it's too late or it's it's less than ideal if you're doing it after the data is already generated in the ideal world you'll be doing it from the point where you're first planning your experiments so at the planning stage then it's things like identifying what your endpoints are identifying your experimental design drafting the first data management plan and your data templates um, for collecting that experimental data um oh why is it slow there we go okay um at the next step then is when you're actually acquiring your data so the acquisition stage this is collecting the data curating it and beginning this process of digitizing it and within nano commons in terms of tools to support that we've been developing um electronic lab notebooks um automated workflows to support your experimental work and some of the data capture templates and we already heard as well about the um, the data capture templates that have been developed um, in the risk gone project as well and that are made available through through eNanoMapper so there's a range of approaches for that um, next step in it is the manipulation so this is where you're starting to do some data processing or pre-processing so this is looking at your data quality control cleaning the data and um, how you're going to store the data and um, other things you're going to to do on it and beginning then your analysis so this could be looking at statistical sets so what kind of statistics can be applied to your data set depending on whether it's um, normal or not uh, norm, um, uh, bin binomial or not, or, or um, also looking then at pre-processing, gap filling and addressing some of the QA, quality assurance and quality control steps. And again, we've been developing tools um, to support that that are on offer through the TA, which I'll talk about in a minute, the transnational access. And um, the next step then is when you've got your data, you've got your raw data, you've got your pre-processed data and you've got your analyzed data, then you need to think about the storage. And this links back to some of the things that um, Klaus and Thomas and, and Amar were talking about. So this includes your data and your metadata, both the storage of them and the indexing of them. And it's this indexing step that I think makes them the most findable um, and then making them interoperable. So almost irrespective of which database they're in. Um, and one of the things that Nano Commons is working on is um, database interoperability. So you put your omics data, for example, in the optimal omics database, and then you put your nanomaterials characterization in perhaps a characterization database, and then your toxicity data set might go into eNanoMapper or NanoCommons or um, wherever you put it best. And then the interoperability will bring those all together. And then the database linking. So again, we're offering a number of tools to support that. And then finally, we've heard already about the FAIR, so I won't talk about that. We've heard about the metadata com uh, community consensus, the scientific FAIR principles, and the semi-automated store cards, score cards even. <laughs> Um, so that summary then is sort of the, the range of tools and supports that are available to the community through 
Nano Commons as one portal, but there are others. Um, and then just to, before I hand over then to some demonstrations, just to say that we are making all of these tools available through our transnational access platform. And these are access to the existing tools as they've been developed, or you can tailor them to the needs of your specific lab or project. And the transnational access offers funded access to the expertise needed to implement the data lifecycle tools to your workflows. And the link is there. We run it as a rolling call, but we have sort of periodic review dates. So um, to align with this conference, we're proposing to have the next review date around the 1st of December. So please do get in touch either with myself or Tassos or Martin or any of the NanoCommons partners that you'll you, you've seen many of them already today and will continue to see. So then in terms of what we're actually going to do for the rest of this session, having now introduced what we mean by the data life cycle, um, we're going to give some very brief tool demonstrations and then there'll be further chances to dig into some of these um, next Monday in the training session. So first up, we're going to have um, an introduction to the exposure and risk assessment tool developed in Nana Commons, and that'll be by Pericles and Harry. Then we'll have a brief look at the read across of nanomaterials properties to cytotoxicity, um, and that'll be presented by Tassos. Then we'll have another um, exposure, a human exposure model um, developed uh, for aerosols, and that'll be presented by Nicholas. Then we will have um, an introduction to the um, the ideas, the background, the me methodology and the current state of the nanoinformatics uh, platform. And then finally, a call to action on the ontology wiki and the, the ontology task force that Thomas Exner is leading. So with that, then I will hand back to Martin to pull up the first of the tools, which is the exposure and risk assessment tool. Oh, Harry, perfect. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we do. Okay, um, I think this is the uh, the final slide, Martin. So can you? Okay, that's fine. Uh, thank you, Isolde. Thank you, uh, Martin, for the introduction. Um, uh, so uh, uh, this will be a very short presentation uh, and demonstration of the Nano Commons Exposure Risk As Risk Assessment Tool. Um, uh, I will give a, a very short introduction, then Pericles uh, will take the floor to uh, uh, to make the demonstration, the live demonstration. In the bottom of this slide, you can see the names of the people that have been involved in the development of the of the method and uh, implementation of of the tool. Uh, so uh, uh, this slide pre presents the basic uh, idea uh, of the workflow, which is based on the OECD guidance document that you can see on the. Uh, on the right uh, uh, here. Um, the workflow actually integrates uh, three different uh, modeling methods and approaches, which is the ex external modeling, uh, toxicokinetics modeling, and uh, modeling that uh, is related to uh, the concept of uh, adverse outcome pathways. Uh, in the next slide, um, um, I'm giving some more details about the workflow. Uh, on the exposure side, uh, we use the uh, Guide Nano uh, uh, tool in order to, uh, uh, to to create some exposure scenarios. And then uh, we use uh, a PPPK model uh, to compute uh, internal uh, doses in tissues uh, and organs as functions, functions of time. On the right side, uh, on the hazard side, uh, we use the benchmark uh, modeling uh, approach in order to uh, compute uh, points of departure at the level of uh, AOPs. And then we combine these two in order to arrive to the final risk assessment. Some more information about uh, the different tools that uh, we integrate in the uh, risk assessment uh, workflow. On uh, the left here, you can see some information about uh, the nanomaterial that we use in our case study, which is uh, the titanium dioxide, NM102. And on the uh, right side of the slide, you uh, uh, can see uh, how we create uh, the exposure scenario. So we start with uh, um, uh, uh, an activity scenario. Uh, uh, we define the dimensions of, of the room, of the factory actually, where uh, 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 this activity uh, takes place. And then uh, uh, we use the tool, the, nano, uh, the guide nano tool, 
uh, in order to uh, calculate uh, the distribution uh, and the evolution of uh, nanomaterial as a function of uh, time and space. Uh, actually, we have uh, two uh, different uh, parts of the room, two different boxes, which is the uh, near field, where the release uh, of the nanomaterial happens, and the far field, which is the rest of the room. Now, by combining the two, uh, uh, we can uh, actually track the movements uh, of uh, an individual, of a worker uh, that uh, moves around uh, the factory uh, um, uh, between the near field and the far field, and we create the final exposure, exposure scenario, the final exposure simulation. Um, now, this is the input to the PBK uh, model, the biokinetic model, uh, which is used to, to uh, create uh, um, simulations uh, for uh, internal concentrations or masses as uh, functions of time in different organs or uh, tissues of the system. Um, this is a PPK model that we have created in the context of nanocommons. Um, uh, this is actually for rats. Uh, uh, we started uh, with uh, information for, for, for rats um, uh, using uh, uh, literature data. And then we extended this, we extrapolated this to, to mice uh, using again uh, uh, data from the literature and the open source MPPBD um, um, uh, software. And uh, this is the last part of uh, the workflow where we combined a number of uh, uh, bioinformatics uh, tools in order to uh, arrive to the calculation of the benchmark dose of the point of departure at the level of uh, AOP. I'm not going into more details here. I'm just uh, giving, uh, showing the, the last slide which uh, presents the workflow. Um, so, um, uh, we um, um, start with the gene expression data uh, at different time points for uh, mice, actually. Um, we first uh, identify the differential expressed uh, genes, and then we apply the benchmark dose um, uh, method on each individual uh, gene. Uh, the same data uh, were actually used to uh, identify the associated pathways um, to the uh, differentially expressed genes, and in parallel, um, uh, we used, uh, we applied uh, the CTT um, um, uh, tool, the CTT database on the AOP of interest, which in our case is 173. This is related to lung fibrosis in order to find the associated pathways to this uh, specific uh, um, AOP. Um, uh, then we uh, took uh, the, the common uh, uh, pathways between the two uh, groups and uh, we apply it again, we calculate again uh, the points of departure for each specific pathway, and uh, finally for the complete AOP, which was computed as the median of uh, the 10 uh, most uh, sensitive uh, pathways. So that's all from my side. Um, uh, thank you for your attention, and I think we can uh, transfer the, uh, the floor to Pericles, who is going to uh, give the demonstration. Okay, thank you, Professor Sharinvez. I hope that you can all hear me clearly. I'm going to switch to screen sharing. Okay, I hope that uh, now you can see my screen. Uh, the, uh, the tool is hosted uh, by our colleagues uh, over in Nova Mechanics under the Enalos uh, cloud platform. And it is uh, fairly easy to use. It consists of three different modules, the external exposure, the internal exposure, and the risk assessment. Uh, looking into more, more detail in uh, each module, uh, the external in the external exposure module, the user can select one of the four uh, pre-uploaded cases uh, which were uh, calculated using Guide Nano or upload the custom scenario. Uh, in the case of a pre-uploaded case, the user can download the time series and uh, investigate it in more detail. And in the case of a custom-made scenario, the user can uh, download the template and based on that, uh, build and upload the desired scenario. In each case, you can see to the right of the screen the concentration uh, time profile of the exposure setting. Moving on to the internal exposure now, uh, the user can insert uh, wait for a, for a mouse and press compute. And then what happens under the hood is that the tool uh, uses an API call to communicate uh, with the PBK model, which was uploaded on the jackpot modeling platform. Uh, it sends, uh, the model sends 
the the data of the exposure setting and the weight of the mouse to the PPPK model. And the PPPK model returns two things. The first thing is uh, the mass time profile, uh, which you will soon uh, see uh, on the screen to your right if everything goes well. Okay. Over here, you can see the mass time profile uh, of the deposited uh, the, the mass time profile yes of the deposited uh, titanium dioxide mass in the lungs compartment and the the other thing that the uh, the PBK model returns is a mass distribution uh, for the, at, uh, the of the resulting titanium dioxide mass at the end of the eight hour exposure time. Uh, the fact that this is this is enabled. The distribution is enabled by the fact that uh, the PPK model was built using uh, stochastic methods. So uh, if uh, you provide the same input multiple times to this uh, stochastic PPK, uh, the resulting output is a distribution and not a point estimate. And um, uh, this gives us an advantage because with this uh, architecture right now we can upload more PBPK models on Jackpot uh, and extend the tool. Now, moving on to the final module, the risk assessment module, you can see the mass distribution of the titanium dioxide, as I said before, in the lungs after the eight hour exposure. And the red vertical line is the point of departure. Now, uh, the user can select from this drop down menu uh, multiple uh, point of departures related to different pathways or the AOP, the median uh, point of departure of AOP 173, which is related to lung fibrosis, as Professor Sarimbe said. And uh, he has another option. He can select either uh, short-term effects or long-term effects, uh, which were calculated uh, using uh, one day and 28 days post-exposure toxicogenomics data. Uh, now, if the red line uh, crosses the distribution, the mass distribution, or even worse, is on the left side of the mass distribution, then we have a risky scenario. Otherwise, we do not. For the for this specific pathway, we can see that we have a risky scenario. But if we select a different pathway from the drop-down menu, uh, of course, uh, the scenario can uh be considered non-risky as in the case of the node like receptor signaling pathway uh, now what the user can do if a risky scenario is recognized uh, he can alter the process uh, for example uh, in this case that we have titanium dioxide he can reduce the uh, the involved amount of titanium dioxide or add protective measures for example a mask and uh, produce a new uh, exposure uh, curve using the guide nano or another custom made tool then rerun the calculations and see if risk was mitigated as a very small case study right now i'm gonna i'm gonna show you what happens uh, with the chemokine signaling pathway uh, for a 40 gram mouse under case one which involves 45 grams of titanium dioxide uh, you can see that we have a risky scenario uh, because uh, the POD intersects the mass distribution. But uh, if if we select case two, which involves less titanium dioxide mass, then for the same uh, pathway, we see that risk is uh, mitigated. Uh, the tool is uh, at the stage of a proof of concept, of course. And the goal is to extend it by adding more uh, materials and eventually move on to human. Uh, risk assessment. Uh, that was all for me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for a very, very clear and concise demonstration of the tool. And I guess it's also demonstrated the sort of the broad principle of um, both NanoCommons and then the NanoSolvit IATA, which is developing, which is to link um, pre-existing and custom designed components together into an overall um, framework for risk assessment. I don't see any questions yet in the chat. So, um, so there are a couple of, co of, uh, of comments or questions in the chat.
Oh, please, yes. Uh, okay, so very quick uh, answers because uh, due to the lack of time. Um, uh, I think the, the, the answer uh, to one of the questions was uh, made by Pericles. So this demonstration is without controls, but uh, if we identify a risky scenario, then we can go back to uh, guide nano and apply controls in order to reduce exposure. Um, about extending the tool for the chemical mo molecules that can form aggregates, um, uh, not right now. Uh, we need to extend the tool uh, in all uh, three uh, uh, parts and all, all, all three uh, uh, different uh, uh, modeling uh, methodologies and tools. Uh, but this is possible. But we have to do it in in all in all parts. I mean, external exposure, biokinetics, and uh, um, uh, AOP. Um, uh, LP based uh, uh, calculation of uh, point of departure. Perfect. Sorry, I was in the public rather than the Q&A mode, so I missed that. But thank you for spotting that, Harry. OK, perfect. Thank you both. That was a, a fantastic start. And the technology is holding up, which is wonderful. Um, so with no further ado, then I will pass to Tassos, who is going to present um, uh, the QSAR modeling approach. Um, and calculation of uh, zeta potential descriptors. Over to you, Tassos. Do we hear you? We don't either see or hear you yet that I can. Okay, now we just see me, which is never good. <laughs> um, should we skip then to Nicola in the meantime while Tassos is getting himself back in? So Nicola is going to present on a human exposure model as soon as Martin passes the controls and pulls up his slides. Super. Thank you so much, Martin. OK, over to you, Nicola, Nikos, and we'll have Tassos then afterwards when he's... Oh, Tassos is back, but we've got Nikos up, so... Yeah, sorry, you just found the, the set the buttons. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll have Tassos first, and we'll go in the, the order that we we're going. So over to you, Tassos. Thank you. Uh, so th hello, everyone, and apologies for the technical uh, issues. Uh, so in terms of uh, time, I will present a quick overview of two of the tools that we have developed uh, through the NanoSolvit and NanoCommons uh, projects. Uh, the two tools uh, have been uh, developed uh, using QSAR modeling. Uh, and uh, the first one um, uh, aims to actually predict the zeta potential of, of engineered nanomaterials in water. Uh, so to do so, we use the data set uh, from the FP7 Nanomile project containing the physical chemical data of their uh, nanomaterials library. Uh, and the benefit of that was the fact that uh, because the data came from the same project, uh, we minimized the risk of having deviations in terms of the protocol used for the phys physical chemical characterization. Uh, we further enriched the data set with molecular descriptors uh, that can be found or calculated using uh, atomic information of the metals uh, or elements used for the for the synthesis of the nanomaterials uh, from their periodic table and so on. Uh, and we came uh, to find that uh, there were five significant descriptors that could be used uh, to show that we could predict uh, the zeta potential of these engineered nanomaterials. Uh, so these were the nanomaterial core size, uh, the coating type, uh, and three molecular descriptors that we that, that we used to 
enrich the data set, which is the metal uh, ionic radius, uh, the sum of metal electronegativity divided by the number of oxygens uh, present in the chemical formula, and the absolute and the absolute or molecular electronegativity that describes the affinity of uh, the nanomaterial uh, to attract uh, electrons uh, or ions inside the solution. Uh, the model that we actually uh, developed has a predictivity of 90% uh, based on, the, on a division of uh, 70 to 30 training to test set uh, and have an applicability domain 1.947 uh, and can be used uh, also for read across ap approaches. Uh, one thing that we need to uh, actually say here is that the model that we developed, as you can see here, um, does not require any experimental measurement uh, that so that can be used. Uh, so more or less, uh, we are given, um, you can actually use the values of the molecular descriptors here that you can find in, lab in libraries and so on. And then you can add the information on the nanomaterial cross size and the coating time and get an estimate of the zeta potential of the nanomaterial in water. Um, and thus the model can be used so that it can actually, uh, so that the model can be used for the development of, human, of, this, of the design and development of new materials. So a quick overview of how the tool works. Uh, we have implemented a very user-friendly uh, interface uh, for people to use. Uh, so here you can actually see the link uh, that you can actually follow to get to the tool that is publicly and freely available for everyone. Uh, so in the first column here, uh, you can actually uh, type in the material type that you are trying to calculate. Then you, uh, you have a drop-down menu from which you uh, can actually pick uh, the type of coating. Uh, that you would like uh, to use for the development of the materials, if any, you can also use uncoated. And in the bottom, you can see the available types of coatings that we have actually implemented so, implemented so far inside the tool. Then you can actually input the, uh, the values uh, for all of the uh, significant descriptors that we have identified. Uh, and actually, uh, in the user guide that you can actually access through the top left button uh, that you can see here, uh, you can actually find the values that we have calculated uh, for, th for the nanomaterials or metal that we have used uh, in the specific uh, data set that we used. Uh, now, by in the top uh, uh, below uh, that table, you can press execute computations and that will, ex will execute the computation and will give you the result that we will see in a minute. Uh, and then, but you can also use you can upload, uh, download a template info file uh, and fill in if you want to enter multiple uh, nanomaterials and upload it and again execute computation and in which case you will actually get uh, the results. Uh, so, so when you actually execute the computation, you will get a result like, that looks like this. More or less what you're going to get is the ID that uh, was inputted, uh, the prediction of the zeta potential, and then all the nanomaterials that were used uh, based on the data set uh, to calculate uh, this prediction and, and also the Euclidean distances uh, that were uh, calculated so that uh, the closest neighbors that were used to calculate the predicted zeta uh, potential prediction. Uh, so this is the first uh, model and I would like to say that for a more analytical presentation you can actually go to topic five on Wednesday uh, that's a 12-minute presentation on the model. So the second model that we actually developed uh, was uh, using a data set that we retrieved from our partners uh, in, uh, from, uh, that developed the Estu Nano uh, database in South Korea. Uh, so in this case, we again, uh, it was a data set containing the physicochemical data of metal oxide nanomaterials, and we enriched it using molecular and atomistic descriptors uh, that were calculated uh, from the nanosolvit partners. Uh, in this case, we developed, we actually identified uh, seven significant descriptors, two physicochemical, again, the nanomaterial core size, but also the hydrodynamic, the hydrodynamic size of the nanomaterial in a specific medium. Uh, we had two assay-related uh, descriptors, uh, the assay type uh, that uh, is used to uh, calculate the cell viability uh, of uh, the bears to be enrolled to 64.7 cells. Uh, because it has been, and this agrees with other studies that have shown that uh, the type of assay has a significant effect on the results in terms of cell viability and the exposure dose of the nanomaterials uh, inside the cell media. 
And then we had three molecular and or atomistic descriptors, uh, the first of which was the contaction, the energy of the contaction band of the nanomaterial, and then uh, the coordination number of the metal atoms in the cell region uh, of, the, um, uh, of, uh, of the nanomaterial, uh, meaning the surface of the nanomaterial, uh, and the surface normal component of atoms, uh, of all atoms in the cell region again. And these two descriptors, more or less, what they describe is how uh, strongly bound are the atoms, uh, either the metals or the oxygen or the, on the surface of the nanomaterials, uh, of the nanomaterial, and how uh, likely it is uh, for them for the nanomaterial to dissociate and release ions uh, inside uh, the cell media uh, that can raise the cell uh, and uh, cause uh, cytotoxicity. The motor productivity, also... yes, the motor productivity again was 91%. Uh, and the uh, uh, and the user interface is again the same uh, as the one that I showed you uh, in the previous uh, in the previous tool. Uh, again, you have a user guide where you can find all the atomistic or uh, the um, uh, all the molecular descriptors in terms of the conduction band. And again, you can uh, use the, you can enter the core size or the hydrodynamic size and get again. Uh, the weather, uh, the prediction, uh, the neighbors that were calculated, uh, and the rel reliability of the measurement. Uh, again, you can upload the CSV file to do the calculations and download uh, the calculation in an Excel file. And with this, I would like to end and thank you very much uh, for the presentation. And apologies for the technical problems. Perfect. There have been a whole bunch of questions coming in, but uh, which we might take while Martin is moving over to, to Nicola's presentation. So the first one was from Irini, which was asking if you were missing one of the three um, nominal particle characteristics that you needed to input for the zeta potential, could you still run the model? No, you could not. Uh, so uh, you could get the molecular descriptors directly from, uh, from us. Uh, and we will be looking to enrich the data sets even more. Uh, in the case, if you are missing some of the physicochemical descriptors, uh, then you can either get a guessing of what it was, uh, use uh, the supplier's information regarding the nominal size of the, um, of the coating, let's say for the data potential, uh, or a good guess, I guess, for the, um, uh, for the, for what the nanomaterial is. But if you're missing one of the descriptors, then you would not be able to run the model because the model is based on, uh, on running uh, using all, the, all of the significant descriptors that have been used. And for example, size is always one of the most significant, uh, having a huge influence, statistical influence in the variance of the data set we used. Uh, in which case, if it's missing, then uh, it would make no sense to use the model and would the, the prediction would be totally unreliable. Yeah, and that would be a good example then of where maybe a, a custom model with a different set of parameters could be developed. Uh, there's a huge number of questions coming in about model validation and where the data sets are available. So I'll just yeah. make a very brief comment that for all of the models being developed in NanoCommons and NanoSolvit, um, we're working very hard to make sure they are all, as Andreas has just put in the chat, tested and validated according to the OECD principles, fully documented with the relevant QMRF report or the MODA template um, and will all be uh, fully documented and reported as part of an IATA case study that we'll feed forward into the OECD um, IATA test uh, IATA case studies program. So working hard to make sure that everything is fully available, the, the QMRF yeah. reports, the data sets for training and validation, etc. Yeah. Okay, in and the interest of time, May sorry, one last yes. sentence answering to two or three questions that I received so very quickly. We're running so out of David, time, Tassa, so very okay. quickly. Uh, no, uh, David, we did not use all the descriptors. We filtered down to the most significant ones. So let's say for the cell viability, we have over 70 descriptors that we used. Uh, and for the zeta potential, they were around 20. Uh, we will develop a model that, uh, that uses different media. We're in the process of doing that but you can extrapolate with the using the current model and there are publications on that. Uh, and uh, uh, Andreas answer reported validation. Um, and- I'm gonna uh, cut you there, Tassos, we've gotta move on, yeah. sorry. 
Um, yeah. There will be more on the on the training day next week. And as Tassa said, he is giving a presentation um, during the week as well in the main conference. So over to Nicolas now for the demonstration of the human exposure model, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you both. Uh, hi from me. Uh, this uh, is a joint work uh, with uh, of uh, nano mechanics of uh, Nova Mechanics uh, with the National Research Center for uh, the Working Environment. Uh, we have uh, developed uh, a web application for the assessment of human exposure in nanomaterials, and this uh, presentation uh, is uh, an overview of uh, the theoretical basis. Uh, after, as a second part, I'm going to show you a short uh, practical uh, uh, example of the actual uh, web uh, applications. Uh, application, sorry. So we have uh, developed uh, a tool that uh, we can use for the assessment of the human exposure in uh, nanomaterials. And uh, with this tool, uh, we want to evaluate uh, the concentration of uh, nanomaterials in uh, indoor uh, environments. So what we have is uh, a geometrical region uh, where the, nanomat the nanomaterials are released, uh, which is uh, called uh, a room. And uh, we partition that room uh, in different areas, such as uh, near field and far field. Uh, near field are uh, the location of uh, the source uh, generator, uh, and every other area uh, besides near field are uh, far field uh, areas. Uh, so here, uh, in the right, uh, you can see a room that it is partitioned in uh, uh, one NF and two FF uh, areas. Uh, every area, every uh, smaller area, must be embedded inside uh, the larger area, and uh, they can be cuboid or uh, uh, cylindrical. Uh, concerning uh, the input of uh, the web of the web application, uh, we need uh, uh, the size distribution of the diameters uh, that uh, characterize the source. Uh, these uh, are called bins. Uh, and we need the bins for a different. Now we support uh, bins from different nanomaterials, such as uh, black tone and uh, titanium oxide. But we also offer uh, the user uh, the possibility to use uh, uh, their own uh, defined distributions uh, of bins. As uh, an outcome, of what uh, we have is uh, the concentration of the nanomaterial uh, per bin uh, per box. Uh, so the uh, underlying equation that we solve is based on the multi-box model. Uh, here you can see the aerosol dynamics particle population balance equation that we solve. Uh, for the number concentration over time, this uh, DN uh, DN, uh, DT. Uh, the J source is the single point particle generation term. Uh, G exchange is the transport uh, between uh, uh, the boxes uh, that we have divided the room. Uh, J coagulation is the coagulation of the nanomaterials due to Brownian diffusion, and th this depends also on the number concentration change rate. Uh, J deposition is the removal of aerosol particles that adhere to the surface. Uh, and here I must say that K runs over boxes and tie over size bits. That, that's why at the end we have uh, the concentration over uh, size uh, over box and uh, over um, B. Uh, some uh, words about uh, the technical part uh, of the application. Uh, uh, this, the application is uh, written in Java, uh, developed in Java. Uh, for the time uh, integration, we use Apache Common Libs and the Dorman Prince uh, algorithm, which uh, makes uh, the overall uh, schema very efficient. And uh, for the web interface, actually the graphical user interface, uh, we use uh, the ZK framework. Um, all these are uh, open source uh, software. So uh, below you can see some of uh, some snapshots of uh, the actual web application, but I'm going to, to show you the real thing in uh, one minute. Uh, this concludes uh, the theoretical part of uh, this presentation. So of course you can contact us and follow us. Uh, but uh, we have a training also this November at uh, 23rd on uh, 12 o'clock, uh, of course, uh, 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 you are uh, all uh, welcome uh, to join us. Uh, so let me now move to the 
practical uh, part of presentation. So here is uh, the web application. Uh, uh, the first thing that the user must do is uh, to define uh, uh, the user should define their geometrical space. Uh, so here we have the area. You can see the room that we talked before, the NF and uh, FF1. Uh, NF is the near field, I remind you, and uh, FF uh, is the, the far field uh, areas. The user can, one, has a, can have only one room and one NF, but it can uh, have multiples, uh, multiple FFs. Uh, as for the SEMA, he can, they can have uh, cuboid or cylindrical uh, areas. Uh, the starting point is uh, where is, uh, if we talk about cuboid, it is the lower left con uh, corner of uh, the box uh, and it can be placed inside the room. Uh, SEMA dimensions are actually the dimensions of the box and uh, uh, these uh, rates, uh, the first uh, flow rate uh, is uh, the exchange uh, flow rate between the boxes. Uh, the flow from, from inlet, it's... Um, is uh, a flow from the environment to inside the box and flow to exhaust is from the box to the environment. Uh, so for this example, uh, I will uh, place uh, an, F bo an a NF box in 111 and I will give it these dimensions. Uh, and uh, for the flow uh, of the boxes, I will give a value of 10. You see that as I... Um, all right, in these uh, uh, boxes, uh, we have uh, the actual shapes and size drawn uh, below. Here you can see the room, the room's top view, and here the room side view. Uh, for the FF, uh, I will uh, use exactly the same dimensions as the room. You see that it became blue and red. And I will put here 10 and for the exhaust 5. Now, this is important uh, in the case that we want to enable the deposition term. Uh, if the room, the, the, the walls of the room does not match uh, uh, the walls of uh, uh, the room, uh, then uh, there will be no deposition. Let me give you a, a, an example about it because uh, it's more easy to consider like that. So I put a width of the, in, uh, the FF for one region of two. You see here, this became smaller. So. In this size here, there will be no deposition because it does not uh, coincide uh, with uh, the wall uh, of the room. For this uh, part here of uh, FF1, they it will uh, have enabled deposition. So by putting the, this to four, uh, every room of uh, FF1 participates uh, in deposition. Uh, moving uh, next, we have uh, the scenario description. The scenario descriptions are actually uh, we define our material. Uh, for now, we have uh, these materials here, uh, black toner and uh, uh, dio uh, titanium dioxide uh, with gold. And uh, we have different size depending on the nanomaterials uh, uh, diameter. Of course, as I, showed, uh, as I said, uh, the user can also define the, their own uh, distribution. Uh, for this example, I'm going to use uh, black toner. Uh, for the simulation uh, input, uh, first we define the modeling time. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, we define the modeling time. I will put here 100. And uh, for the time of source being active, I will put uh, 10. That means that uh, for uh, 100 of modeling time, the first 10 seconds will be, the source will be activated. I use uh, one repetition and I will include uh, coagulation and the position. Uh, here I can change also the physical parameters. Uh, I will not do right now. And then I press uh, simulate. So I got my result real fast because I use a small modeling time. The results show us uh, the different areas that we want to uh, plot our results actually. And we have to select also a bin uh, based on the source distribution. And uh, if I do so, I can get uh, the concentration for uh, NF box for bin one. Of course, I have multiple selection here, for example, all, uh, which shows me uh, all uh, the bins uh, concerning uh, region NF. 
And uh, finally, I can use download uh, in order uh, to download my results in a CSV format. And uh, I can go here and uh, uh, moment. yes, and uh, have it in a Excel, for example, uh, in order uh, for to analyze it uh, further. And here we have again the input uh, in order for the user to know exactly what he has done and the outputs. Here you can see the NF, the time that we just uh, simulate, the time steps, sorry, and the different beans with uh, the concentration. Uh, so uh, that's it from my part. Uh, Perfect. Thank you very much. And I know it's not easy to do a demonstration live. So thank you so much. <laughs> uh, we just had one question come through about whether the um, the material that you use could be a virus. So I guess we'd need to parameterize that, but whether in principle the model could work. Uh, it could, but uh, I'm not sure to tell you the truth. Uh, <laughs> but it's a great but, question, uh, Giancarlo. So we'll definitely, we'll yes, definitely come back to you and, and talk about it. Perfect. Yes, Thank you yes, again, Nikos. That was wonderful. And in the interest of time, I've, I apologize for my rudeness, but we do need to keep galloping on so that we don't <laughs> encroach on lunchtime and the nano safety cluster meeting. So next up, no, we no have... Problem at all. Thank you. Next up, we have Gian Petro, who is going to talk us about the idea, the methodology, and the current state of the nanoinformatics platform. So over to you, Gian Petro. Hi, thank you very much. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can perfectly. Thank you. Sorry for the glitch with the uh, webcam, but I don't know why there is the uh, hardware problem, which I'm not able to solve. But anyway. Um, yes, as I said, I'm going to present to you the idea, methodology, and current state of the nano of development of the nanoinformatics platform. Uh, nanoinformatics uh, is a project which started uh, one year and a half ago, so we are still in the development uh, stage. But uh, uh, I can show you the initial results. So let me start with uh, the idea behind this uh, uh, methodology. Uh, usually, when dealing with uh, projects uh, or uh, tasks in general. We are not focusing uh, on uh, single models, but uh, we have uh, a set of models which we want to execute. And then we want to uh, merge uh, <clears throat> the results of such models, or we, or we may want to use the, the output of a model as an input uh, uh, from another model. For, for instance, this is the um, human health uh, uh, occupational scenario for evaluating uh, risk assessment uh, for, yeah, for human health in a occupational scenario that we have uh, in the, the sun decision system uh, where we have uh, we evaluate uh, um, uh, exposure thanks thanks to the nano safer uh, tool then we uh, evaluate uh, uh, benchmark dose thanks to Prost, and we use it uh, for a probe to extrapolate a human dose, and then we merge the two results, and, and we have uh, uh, and we calculate the risk. So this is the main idea. So we want to to have a platform being able to to generalize it uh, and to link as much as possible models uh, by mer by matching inputs and outputs. To do so, uh, we in the context of the nanoinformatics project, we built uh, uh, we we want to connect the system of databases and modeling tools selected and validated uh, in the context of the project uh, by means of a common application interface. Uh, specifically, this platform that we are developing should easily connect database and model should uh, allow to be extendable. So we we want to use the extended platform by adding new models. Uh, or uh, updating the existing ones, uh, for instance, adding uh, inputs, uh, specific inputs and outputs. And uh, mo most importantly, we want to easily allow linking different models. Uh, to do so, we are following the European Materials Modeling Council uh, sch MODA scheme, which is modeling data. This scheme, uh, sorry, is this one. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, MODA scheme where uh, user case inputs are, uh, are processed by a model, and then uh, uh, the processed output of this model is uh, fed to another model. Uh, yeah, to, to fed to another model in a pipeline or, or a chain of models. Uh, to do such uh, 
associated to the moda scheme there is this uh, moda template which uh, provide uh, all necessary aspect uh, information of a model with respect to description reproducibility curation interfacing uh, interfacing with other models but unfortunately what we found is that it is not sufficient to allow the platform to automatically generate uh, user interfaces and uh, to automatically match inputs and outputs uh, uh, and to validate uh, such uh, inputs and outputs. So what we decided in the, in the project was to, uh, to create, uh, uh, in addition to the moda file, a manifest file, which is, which, uh, a manifest file which is a JSON file that describes the set uh, of inputs uh, that the model is expecting with optional default values and the set of outputs that the model is producing in such a way that is understandable by the platform, not only by, not, but not uh, by humans, but by the platform. Uh, this uh, manifest file allows to match inputs and outputs, uh, and so the, to create a chain, allows to automatically generate uh, user interfaces, uh, contains rules uh, for validating uh, user inputs, uh, and sets uh, domains uh, and cross domains of uh, different inputs. For instance, uh, uh, an input should be in a specific range, or uh, uh, we have a cross domain. So, for instance, in the case of Prost, uh, BM, the upper dose, uh, upper, upper benchmark dose should be no more than 10 times higher than the lower benchmark dose. Uh, as I said before, we are also uh, providing a common API for all the, these models that will be included in the platform. Uh, this API, has, uh, in the current version, has uh, the, a mandatory uh, interface, which is to predict an outcome uh, or a set of, of outputs given a set uh, of inputs, and then has uh, 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 optional interfaces for training a model, validating it, uh, updating a model, or checking whether the input uh, provided by the users lies in the applicability domain of uh, such model. In addition, of course, uh, it uh, has uh, uh, interfaces for authentication, user management, uh, and to show the, to create tasks and show the task status, so the model execution status. Uh, as I said before, thanks to the manifest file, uh, we are uh, able to match inputs and outputs uh, uh, and so to create uh, uh, the, chain, the chain of models or, or the pipeline of models. Uh, the platform uh, indeed automatically generates the user interfaces for, in for inserting such inputs and outputs uh, and displays the outputs as dynamic charts. Uh, moreover, uh, yeah, thanks to, um, it's able to, to fetch the, the results of the common API and to, to, to provide such outputs. Uh, we are, as I said before, in the early stages of development, so the common API and the manifest file will be refined during the project to better fit uh, to models requirement. Uh, just to give you an overview on how the platform is structured, it runs in Docker containers. Uh, it's a web-based application, so it's based to, to Meteor and React. Uh, while the backend, uh, um, regarding the backend, uh, the API is provided by Fast API, which is a uh, state of the art for um, a, a Python uh, API, um, for building APIs, and it allows to run uh, Python, R, and uh, JavaScript models, uh, which are included in the platform. Uh, we also have a tool for automatically convert the MATLAB script uh, into Python scripts, and so to run it uh, in the uh, thanks to the Python backend. Uh, moreover, we are uh, we we can uh, wrap uh, a tool which is not developed in such la programming languages uh, directly in the platform backend. For instance, uh, it can be applied for uh, models written in C, C++, or Java. Moreover, we we may also want to link external uh, tools which are, cannot be included uh, in the platform this is possible and the user will be asked to externally run the model and then upload uh, the required results uh, on the platform to use such results in, in, in subsequent models uh, in the chain as inputs uh, just to provide you an overview on how the current implementation of the platform is uh, this is the main page there are three possible uh, use cases so execute the single models, execute the chains of models or projects which are collection of chains and models. Uh, this minute, is the model. Please. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, this is the model inventory. So the user, uh, when when he clicks to models, has the all the models included in the platform. This one are just the platform. Uh, sorry, models that we have. Uh, so 
the final inventory will be different from this one. one uh, once a user selects a, a, a model, it will it is landed to the model landing page. Uh, where there is a description of the model, uh, a button to download the model file, and the possibility to create uh, instances of this model, so execution of these models. Um, the input page is generated, uh, generated automatically from the manifest file, and uh, yeah, the, the inputs are validated according to the manifest file. Once the user executes uh, the model uh, with these inputs, uh, Outputs uh, are uh, shown by means uh, of um, statistical uh, summaries and uh, by dynamic charts. A user can select uh, the type of chart that he wants starting from the, from the output. Uh, this is uh, the overview of the train editor where the user can link uh, different models and in future it will be able also to link uh, different chains uh, from the chain inventory. Uh, to just to summarize the work done so far in the context of the project we are developing this platform which will allow to link uh, models in pipelines the model uh, user interface is automatically generated thanks to the manifest file uh, inputs and outputs uh, are uh, of different models are uh, matched thanks to this manifest file uh, allow, thus allowing to create uh, pipelines the first version of the platform will be available to project partners before the end of this year while the final version will be available in 2023 and thank you for your attention perfect thank you very much for a very very clear uh, overview uh, there's a couple of questions that just come in for you yep. and while thomas is coming up with his mentimeter again um, one is um, are the input and outputs linked to the ontology terms and then the other is whether the chain editor leads to the manifesto the manifest file automatically yeah, uh, I'll start with answering with uh, Philip, the answer from, from Philip. Uh, yes, we, the goal is to, to provide ontology terms. So that's exactly how we are, we are planning to, to match inputs and outputs. And we will definitely need to use uh, some um, uh, harmonizing tools like the Gracious Wiki to, to, or to, to find, uh, yeah, to, to proper assign uh, ontology terms to specific inputs and outputs. So yes, to answer it, yes, the, uh, we are we are using ontologies. Uh, the sign editor leads to manifest file automatically. Uh, no, the sign editor merges different manifest file, but this is uh, still under development. So it's uh, uh, it's a preliminary answer. I don't know the, in the yet in the final version how it will look like. Uh, Regarding the manifest file, we will provide a tool for uh, um, generating it, uh, to, to help generating it. Super. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we're having to rush a little bit. Uh, Thomas, I'll give the last no, no word to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether you need slides again, Thomas, or just you want your camera on or what you want, but over to you. I hope that Martin can bring up my slides. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the question from Philip was already direct a nice starting point for me. Uh, it's a little bit different now topic because we are now uh, just a call for actions on ontology collection and, and it's, it seemed to be quite some um, efforts going on and but also quite an interest in this um, in these ontologies. Again, like the, in the, my first talk, I had uh, a small, small work uh, or a Menti uh, poll. You are still unhappy to if you if you fill it in. I already saw that they are much more than than I filled in already, which is a good sign. Um, but I will show that later. Um, just a very quick overview. Um, ontology development is something again, which which is really depending on many people and. There is the starting point for people who try to annotate their data or their output, input, output, and so on. And, and there is the need for ontology terms. But then we need a group who really then develops um, uh, the, the definitions for these terms, check if there are synonyms, and so on. And, but that is really the domain expert. That is you. Um, and from that on, this will then go into 
you don't see my, my slide, uh, my pointer, I think. Oh, you see, we okay, do. Do. Um, great. Um, then you go into the uh, ontology development, where then really this is structured in form of an ontology. But I, I think what we are really missing here in many, many areas is the definition of these ontology terms and, and then uh, a clear definition of what that is and, and what we mean by that. Yeah, and therefore, we have on the one side, and you saw the, the gracious uh, wiki already, uh, gracious agreed on that they share that with the whole nano safety cluster, and we are now building on top of that uh, with different areas, and nano informatics is one of them. You see the FISCAM characterization as one area, and um, you will see later that there are many others. Uh, but my starting, the first five I put in were exactly the five you see here, safe by design, this is regulatory, and so on. Yeah, therefore, we start there and we invite everyone here is, uh, this is what, what I do here at the moment. I invite everyone to participate in these developments. And if you want to participate, please contact me, and then I can give you access to the tool. Um, this is how this is done. Yeah, you have, you can define your terms, you can give them nice definitions, and then you can start discussing with your colleagues and your, your peers. Yeah, that, that you really say, okay, this is a good enough um, uh, definition, or here we have to improve, we have to make it clearer, we have to split perhaps into two because it's too low, uh, too, too broad, and therefore we have to, to have sub, sub, uh, uh, terms as well. All this will be done and then at one point of time we will release a new, uh, we will take all these these comments and put that into a new uh, version of that and then we can say, okay, is that fine? And as soon as many people vote here with a thumbs up, we will move that into, into one ontology. Um, to also get a little bit of a uh, parallel thing is that I would also like to, to just document all the things which are going on. And therefore, we had um, proposed this ontology task force. Um, and I will, again, contact every or uh, many of you here to, to just fill in this short, short survey that I mainly get names that we can really build this community, structure you in a way, what type of, of, you, or of, of activities you are doing, and so on. Therefore, this is all, when you uh, look at your top, there are the links, and you find all these links also there. Um, that's more or less everything I want to show. Um, and again, um, it's, uh, it's, again, something where we would say, um, please contribute as much as possible. Uh, this is the work cloud we have at the moment. I hope you see that. Yeah, there are clearly coming in 40 people now who build something in. Um, I really hope that this is coming more and more. And you see some areas like the governance I've already had is multiple times in here and so on. Safe by design. There are many people because that is bigger. Yeah, advanced materials is something I really see uh, as, as something. AOPs, I know that there are already ongoing and there we can connect to, to also small molecule. But that's everything. I hope that you find the, the, the links and please contact me, fill in the survey and, and, and fill in this, this, um, this survey, but also the, the uh, ontology task force survey. And then from that on, we can uh, organize that better, that we really have these overarching cross-projects activities in the ontology field. Thanks. Perfect, Thomas. Thank you so much. And apologies again that we had to rush through it. So that's it. We've come to the end of session four, and I would like to thank all the speakers again. Um, I think we've had some really, really interactive and interesting sessions and loads of great feedback. So we'll capture all of that um, in terms of how we take things forward. Uh, thank you again, and back to you, Martin. Thank you, Isolt, for chairing this great session, which was a very, very squeezed session. I apologize that I put everything into, but I thought it was really interesting to see how many things are there out there. And of course, it's not today that we try to train ourselves in all these different assets, but now you know what's there, who are the people running it. And, uh, you can approach us, the working group A, to distribute uh, or kind of connect you to them, or you come to the Nano Commons project, also TA, so transnational access is mentioned in our dashboard um, and you find the links there. 
and we can also provide you further training next week on uh, Monday, November 20, 23rd in one of our rooms. And of course, in future too, we are going to organize our training sessions. So be sure to subscribe to the mailing list of Work Group A, which is also going to be distributing access to these trainings and further educations to get in touch with the experts in there. So thanks a lot, Isolt, uh, and all the presenters here, um, also for their uh, live uh, insight into the tools, clicking around in the tools. This was always great to see, to see really how does it work um, being applied. And now I would like to transfer the floor directly to Eva uh, Valsami jones also from the University of Birmingham, to um, do the general assembly of the nano safety cluster. Theoretically, you should be able to unmute your microphone, Eva. This you would find uh, as one of the buttons below the NanoSafe 20 picture. And I will meanwhile uh, upload the agenda and the other uh, uh, presentations for the General Assembly. So hopefully I am unmuted now. Can you hear me, Martin? Yes, I can hear you, I guess. All the participants should be able to hear now. Super, thank you. Um, I micro panicked uh, because it's actually very slow in responding the, 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 the system. So welcome everybody to, to the Nano Safety Clusters General Assembly. Um, I don't know about um, the rest of the audience. I am totally breathless from the speed and, and quality of science we have been um, we have had the pleasure of, of listening to this morning. Absolutely amazing. And, and, and bear in mind, this is just a taste literally of what our uh, working groups um, are doing, both um, in, during the, the like, normal activities during, during the year, but also um, um, you will have the opportunity to hear a lot more nano safety cluster link talks in the rest of the meeting. So stay where you are. There's nothing. There's nowhere better to go. So um, with n not much, well, actually, with some much further ado. Normally, I, I would have said no much further ado. Um, I would have uh, introduced um, uh, our special speaker, Soren Boward from uh, the Deputy Head of the Materials for Tomorrow Unit of DG Research and Innovation. Unfortunately, his network is down at the moment, would you believe? So, um, so whilst we're trying to sort out uh, some kind of um, um, alternative plan, either introduce him a little bit later in the sequence, you, you, you had a chance to glance at the um, program sequence just earlier and um, so there's a few presentations so hopefully we'll we'll bring him in in between our presentations rather than right at the start which was the original plan or in absolutely worst case scenario he will record his presentation and, and send it to us and we'll we'll share with with his audience um, at some other point uh, unfortunately that's the um, um, there are advantages but also the clear disadvantages of, 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 of running these sessions remotely and we always depend on technology sometimes it lets us down okay so um, right so just a very quick um, um, recap of, of the schedule which which has already moved from my screen so it doesn't matter it will be me starting um, so let's yeah, and then then we have um, so my presentation is pretty much the action since last meeting. Then we have pre-recorded statements from each working group, uh, presentation from uh, Fleming, which is also pre-recorded, so no chance of a, a, uh, of problems there on the Malta initiative. Then Andreas will pick up the um, internationalization, um, and then we have an open discussion. So please, um, please participate uh, in the usual way through the chat and um, let's make a start with my presentation then you have a very short break and um, I actually do not apologize for the short uh, breaks and the, the very packed day we've been having today because it has been so much fun um, and I hope you as you're all at home, you can grab a quick lunch rather than having the nice kind of face-to-face -face lunch we would have had normally. Um, so Martin, you'll be 
change in my slides, is that right? I will assume so. In... Sorry, yeah, I, I go back. <laughs> I was just checking. You can um, also right. just press the cursor on your keyboard. Cursor on my keyboard. Uh, oh, right. Okay, okay, fantastic. I'll 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 try that. Uh, so I'll scream if it doesn't uh, work. Work. Um, okay, so um, let me say a few words about the nano safety cluster. Well, you obviously all know um, some things about the cluster. That's why you're here today. But um, I just uh, bring maybe a little of, of, a, of an annual update or the actions, the, the highlights of the, of the last year, so to speak. And in case you need a reminder, um, you can see the members of the coordination team, myself, Andreas Fleming, and the omnipresent Tassos. Um, and goodness me, since I'm doing an annual update, what a year it has been, a little over, 12, nearly 13 months ago, um, we were all happy in Copenhagen, not uh, expecting what came to, to the world, never mind each one of us individually. But the nano safety cluster actually managed to stay very active, very, very um, um, prominent in, in our lives, I hope. And, and hopefully today and next Monday and in between, you might uh, see a lot of, of evidence for, for this. Um, so we all know who we are, but <clears throat> a little reflection is 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 maybe not going to do us a harm. We really need to 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 remember who who we are sometimes. Again, especially in difficult times like we we're all experiencing now. Um, so the nano safety cluster was initiated by the European Commission to ensure that all these wonderful projects doing nano safety re research stay connected. Um, we've been going for, for about 10 years um, and I would say that the nano safety cluster has three key roles, everything else is just around these key roles, which is to to represent you guys, each one of you in the audience and uh, some others who haven't been able to join us today, perhaps. So we are our community, nothing more, nothing less. So um, that doesn't only apply to, to the activities we take, but also to, 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 to moving forward in, in the future. Perhaps this time, more than ever in our 10 years, of existence, we need our community to 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 work with us in 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 framing um, our future. We're also, of course, very closely connected with the European Commission, and indeed, we is there's a two-way communication in terms of providing support and information and receiving um, uh, updates of where the Commission would expect us to be and how we can actually um, strengthen our, our, our role um, in terms of, of, our, of, of the science we, we deliver to the world. And I say this because also ultimately our work aims to give the public confidence in, in science and in nanoscience specifically. So uh, we should always remember that. Okay, so as I said, we've all been very busy bees over the last 12 months, despite everything else happening around us. So I'm doing a few little individual slides on the update at different levels. So the coordination team level, first of all, uh, we have been very busy keeping you busy and um, keeping you in touch, discussing internal and external uh, priorities, uh, engaging the community, organizing activities or supporting the organization of activities, um, engaging with individual groups, making sure that they're happy, they're active, they know where they're going, they get the feedback from, from us as and when necessary. So we have certainly uh, perhaps spend most of our time, active time for the nano safety cluster doing this. Also, in, in, um, in our spare time, we've been working on our strategic vision, and I'll say a little bit more about it later on. We have um, identified 
linked to very important key actions for, for, for the coordination team. Uh, first one, the support of the Malta initiative, and you hear about that from Fleming um, after me. Uh, second, the internationalization role of, of, of the cluster, and you hear more about that from, uh, from Andreas after me also. Um, our working groups have been super busy as well. Uh, you have, of, of course, seen the evidence this, this morning. Um, in fact, I think it's fair to say that we already, from, from what we've seen this morning, we exceeded um, the the expect not the expectations but the um the level of of accomplishment that that we we reached uh, last year and i think that's that's always been the objective how can we do each year better than the last and i think we definitely hit the mark this this year so the working groups have been very busy showing you what science we can showcase that's direct, directly linked to the nano safety class so you hear a lot more of course uh, later this this afternoon um the working groups have not been static in, in their own um, roles, in their own um, presence. Uh, they, they have been working to, to optimize what, what they do, and this is sometimes through new leadership, and we, you will hear that. Um, I've already mentioned, just to emphasize, there will be a recorded, brief, tiny um, teaser effectively from each working group after uh, my presentation. And you will hear a little bit of an update of where each working group is at the moment, where we have new leadership, what they've been focusing on, uh, where, we, where the old leadership decided to uh, revamp, refocus, uh, for example, working group um, C qualifies in the second uh, grouping what they've done to, to refocus um, the, their activities. You will also see what each individual working group has been doing um, as, an, as an overview. And each one is very different. Each one has its, its own priorities internally um, designed and tailored really to, to their community, to their sub-community. So um, I hope that will come through in the working group presentations. Um, of course, there's been a huge amount of activity in each one of your projects at, pro at individual project level, where we could and where we were asked and required, we supported these activities. It was a pleasure to attend some events. The, the, the first two that came to mind, the Nano Harmony project, uh, project event uh, for several days a few weeks ago, Smart Nano Talks closing um, event. Amazing opportunities. Uh, the Smart Nano Talks was over the summer. Apologies again. Amazing opportunities to to see um, either where where a project has been or where it's heading. There's been other project activities. Please forgive those projects who didn't hear the names. Please forgive me. It's not that I didn't um, pay attention. It's just that there has been so so much. But anyone who wants to um, track any previous activities or indeed any future activities, please don't forget the calendar on the Nano Safety uh, Cluster website. Um, and of course, all these events were actually promoted, supported, participated by our community, by you guys listening to me today. And, and that is why the events were, were a success. <clears throat> Um, in terms of dissemination, um, it's really important to emphasize, and again, you hear it in the working group presentations a little bit later, th th that the cluster and its dissemination group didn't sit still waiting for, for the pandemic to pass, but it actually responded with great agility to the new conditions. They started organizing web delivered events. We had a number of, of, of webinars that were really very successful. We have, of course, this meeting we, we're here to attending today, and um, it would be a huge omission on my part to not say a huge thank you to Martin and Stella for 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 absolute amazing work and and hours and hours and hours of preparation, which I hope is showing today because they've really they are really delivering an amazing event. 
I should also mention our newsletter. We um, have a quarterly newsletter. I do hope everyone knows, but should anyone have forgotten, please remember. In fact, we're preparing now the winter issue. So any news items you think you would like to share with a cluster, please go on the website, um, link uh, or find the newsletter page and submit meet your items and again a huge thank you to Leslie and and also to to Claire for um, putting so much effort in this newsletter please go and read if you haven't already the last issue it was a bumper issue I haven't seen a larger issue in in in, in all my years in the nano safety cluster so really there is a lot going on also, in terms of dissemination activities, of course, we supported earlier this year the USEU communities of research. We also supported a number of other international activities, and I don't, I just want to not miss the opportunity to emphasize it, but you hear a lot more from um, Andreas later. And I would just like to spend literally, how long have I got? Maybe two minutes, I don't have much longer looking forward because I think it's important, especially now. Um, first of all, it's worth reminding ourselves that we haven't, we really haven't been static. Uh, the nano safety cluster has been continuously remodeling itself to follow what's necessary to adapt to, to, to what's the, uh, what's happening around us. So, uh, Data has never been more important, for example, particularly looking after our data, curating, making them fair. You heard it all this, this morning, but just think a year or two ago that the issue of data didn't even exist. So I hope it shows the agility with which we, we moved as a community. Also, I think it's notable to, to emphasize how well the group um, projects have worked together, the, the projects in governance, for example, that are a nice little community, a recently created community on Safe by Design, again, projects working together, and I hope the evidence will be, will be um, very clear to you by, by the end of, end of this, this event. Um, and also, when new opportunities arise, good example, micro and nanoplastics, we jump on board, we don't wait, we, we, we make the most of, of what we, we can as, as a community for, um, for the greater good, I guess. Um, so, where are we going now? Um, we, we certainly start in the small scale. Our website is pretty much our, our, our heart, our beating heart, uh, representing the, the community and engaging with the community. It's there 24-7. Um, so it's critically important to, to our communication with you and the world. So in January, we're starting a, a new revamp. And those of you have, who have been around know it's been before. We've revamped it before, but we want to stay active and, and ensure that it has it, it, it delivers what you guys have have been asking for. Um, on a la slightly larger scale, now is time to review um, who we are, what we are, what we're called perhaps even, because things have changed and my next couple of slides will be about all the change. So we need to define a new strategy, a new vision and a new roadmap and you need, we need you um, to actually be part of this. So please, please um, stay engaged, stay active, because business as usual is no longer an option, and I hope that's already clear. But let me show you my next couple of slides to, to clarify why that is. Well, first of all, we have a brand new framework program, and I hope people have started engaging with what might be coming through this framework program, but certainly huge changes compared to what we were used to in Horizon 2020. We have the European Green Deal and we have the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability, again, um, defining a very different environment that we have to move with the times and be part of. 
I highlighted two little two little uh, things in each one of these key drivers, the Gre European Green Deal. Um, those of you who haven't read it, please read it cover to cover as I as I have done, because it tells you so much that, that you need to know. Um, it shows very clearly that um, nanotechnology is absolutely central in, in the delivery of all these amazing um, expectations that the European Green Deal has of our continent and of our society. Um, anything from, from climate, um, uh, the climate ambition, zero pollution, Fork, uh, farm for fork, um, farm to fork, excuse me. Each green box in this slide is something that actually cannot be delivered, I would be bold enough to, to state, without nanotechnology. So here's where, where, where we are. And I can see Soren has just joined us, which is absolutely fantastic. So I will very quickly finish and pass the microphone to him. So, um, Talking about key drivers, chemical strategy for sustainability, again, a, a central document to where the future is, is lying. My highlights from, from, this, uh, from this document is that now we don't just do safe by design. We have to be safe and sustainable by design. So we need to, to um, move things a notch for, for um, the importance of it being societally, societally urgent and also economic an opportunity. Um, we need, there will be a simplification and strengthening of the chemical legal framework. And again, I see a huge role in our community through our development of modeling of, of read across activities in supporting this simplification, which cannot happen any other way, frankly. And finally, I picked up review definition of nanomaterial in the chemical strategy for sustainability. So again, something for, for us to be active on. Um, I would like to say, please don't forget the nano safety cluster is, is your, your vehicle. I would like to, I think this slide is supposed to say thank you, but um, it's somehow, um, change the format a little bit and look strange. I would like to thank the audience, but really, really, really also, I do not want to forget to thank past and present members of, uh, of our key delivery vehicles of the coordination team, Isolt Lynch, a big thank you when, for, for all she did before stepping down. Uh, the working groups, all members of working groups that stepped down have been absolutely fantastic. Steering group, of course, all projects that finished and uh, coordinators stepped down have also given us so much. So I would thank everybody again for listening and maybe... Um, we would like to move to Soren now. Soren, are you able to um, to hear us and speak? No. Um, In private chat with Soren and I'm obviously sorry, he cannot hear, hear us, but he, we can hear him actually. He does. Okay. Okay. What What do we do, Martin? Um, we Shall can we actually let's listen let's to his talk if this is possible, although he cannot hear hear us. Let's do let's do the recorded working group presentation and see if we can resolve it. Shall we do that? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody hear me? Yes. You, you might want to show your thumb, Eva, because he cannot hear us. Okay, oh. then I will just try. I cannot hear anything, so uh, I will just try to uh, to tell to tell you a little bit about what I uh, what I had in mind in regard to the uh, uh, to the nano safety meeting here. I think that. Uh, the development of advanced materials and nanomaterials has increased uh, tremendously over the last decade. And uh, now we are seeing some very strongly enhanced functionality and adaptability of the materials. It, for us, it's very exciting to, uh, to witness all these new uh, capabilities when you are a material scientist, because it new needs no, it yields new dimensions for material solutions, and that's quite important also for society. 
But uh, we have all these functionalities. The problem is that it comes with a price. And this price is very often an enhanced complexity of the materials that leads to difficulties for recycling and reuse, as well as an increased carbon footprint, simply because of the, the complexity and also a potential uh, toxicity problem together with uh, through the product life cycle. So with the launch of the Commission's uh, European Green Deal and its focus on zero pollution and sustainability, the Commission a couple of weeks ago presented a new chemical strategy for sustainability that should facilitate safe and more sustainable materials in general with less use of scarce and potentially toxic elements. Considering the boundaries of our planet's resources and the current drive uh, towards less waste, less toxic products with longer lifetime and better recyclability, we need to rethink how we design, produce and make new products and the associated nanomaterials. Today we are linked uh, very strongly and we depend on each other and the value chains that we are using are often very complex and efficient, but they are also very fragile at times, as we are presently uh, witnessing. All the stakeholders that uh, are together need to commit to the work of resilience of the global value chains, and it's an individual responsibility for every one of us in every single link to assure it. In the context of the COVID-19 crisis, it has become very clear that uh, before we need to accelerate the process, we also need to look at the testing and the safety of them. This allows us to benefit uh, to a larger extent from the vast potential of materials in general, uh, and it will contribute to find faster and more effective solutions to provide additional tools to tackle all the different crises that we may come to and also the one we are in presently. And then we can overcome its detrimental effects on our economy and society. I would like to tell you all that we are committed to the development of safe and sustainable materials by design. And we are presently working on a plan to implement this. Part of this plan is the topics that have been designed also together with your help uh, that are foreseen in the work program of Horizon Europe in the first in the first year. The topics we are thinking about is the one which is called safe and sustainable by design polymeric materials. It's safe and sustainable by design metallic coatings and engineered surfaces and safe and sustainable by design organic and hybrid coatings. They're all research uh, topics that are very important. And one of the reasons that they are so important is because they have a big market and they also have a big impact. These are commodities which have a very, very wide reach. And that's also why we're trying to use those the first. But it's not only the topics in the work program, but it's also the further development of the overall concept of safe and sustainable by design, which is embedded in the chemical strategy for sustainability that we are at the moment uh, trying to pursue. And we actually need your collaboration with this. We cannot do it without you, but we also need to extend this towards the industry and other uh, stakeholders. And therefore, we have an additional topic in the work program that is called establishing an EU-wide sustainable by design materials community to support embedding sustainability criteria over the life cycle of products and processes. And this is where we need your help together with the industry, because it's not only an academic exercise. This is a practical rollout. And therefore, as I said, we need your help. And also, we need to work together to achieve these goals. And with this, I would like to uh, wish you um, a successful conference, even though I can't hear you. And I will probably lock off now because it's a little bit tedious to hear yourself talk. But uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Ha, <laughs>
Thank you, sir, and I'm so sorry you can't hear is uh, hear us. Hopefully, you you understand um, actually diving language uh, signals. Um, so um, j just to to really emphasize that um, the link with the European.